All right. All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Council Infrastructure Committee meeting on Thursday, November 16th. Uh, so we have the first item on the agenda is AB 7495 franchise agreement with Seattle Limited Partnership doing business as Verizon Wireless. And Sheldon, you have a presentation for us. Actually, I don't have a formal presentation, but to bring forward and just briefly talk about the agenda bill and the purpose of it and uh, very little, I shouldn't say very little, but a little bit about the franchise, uh, and then we can open it for questions. And I have with me tonight Alana Zana from Ogden Murphy Wallace, uh, who can answer uh, any specific questions about the franchise, as she helped me negotiate the franchise with the uh, folks with Verizon Wireless. So what this agenda bill does is it presents a franchise agreement for wireless facilities within the city right of way, uh, specifically known as small cell facilities. It's a relatively new technology that's out there intended to meet the needs of the wireless carriers for filling gaps in service and to address hot spots where they need to increase the service uh, in the different areas. Uh, what the franchise does, the draft franchise that's been presented to council is it provides for a five-year franchise, renewable in accordance with uh, IMC 12.60, and then also what it does is it allows Verizon to attach these wireless facilities to non-city-owned poles in the right of way. Poles that are owned by the city, it's acknowledged that they cannot attach to our owned facilities unless another agreement is arranged between the city and the carrier. Uh, and so the facilities would still have to go through a land use permitting process through the Department of Development Services. And so this is really just the permissions to allow them to come into the right of way. And that's the real basic tenets of the franchise. Very similar to other franchises, except this one's for wireless small cell instead of a wire line facility. So with that, I'm gonna open it for questions uh, and we can respond as the council may have questions. Okay. Um, so Sheldon, in the packet, we didn't have an example of what the installation looks like, which I think would be helpful um, when this comes to council. So can you describe a little bit about what exactly, if it's a non-city owned pole, what is it? Is it a 10 foot pole that they put in? What, what does it look like? Oh, thank you for asking that. No, they are also under the franchise, they are not allowed to add any poles in the right of way. Oh, okay. Uh, they are only allowed to uh, install on existing poles. It doesn't mean that they aren't allowed to replace existing poles with another pole that would meet their need as well as the owner's need of that pole that they're going to attach to. The facilities themselves are relatively linear in nature, but they can go up to, is it 17 cubic feet? Yeah, the equipment associated with the facilities can, the primary equipment enclosure can be 17 cubic feet. The antennas can be three cubic feet uh, each. So there can be multiple antennas. Typically you see between one and four. And um, other cities are, what other cities have already entered into a franchise agreement? Other cities that have entered into similar agreements, Bellevue and Burien. I believe Tacoma recently entered into one. Uh, Seattle is permitting it on Seattle City light poles right now, so they don't have a franchise agreement, but we're starting to see small cells deployed there. 
I think the city of Everett entered into one. I believe either Spokane did or is about to. It's probably about the same part in the council process. Um, and there are several other cities that are working on a franchise with, with regard to small cell. Okay. Um, in those jurisdictions, do their franchise agreements address aesthetics in any way? Different than how we have? Burien, uh, not different than how, Burien and, Burien does not talk about it different than what you have. I will say that, the, that yours is actually more restrictive than the Burien one. Um, Bellevue, it was a different type of agreement. This is a citywide agreement. In Bellevue, they specifically attached the designs and only allowed the construction of small cell facilities in three distinct areas. And that's because it was passed about a year ago. Um, and small cell was even at that time more new. I mean, the city council of Bellevue and the staff there were not as familiar as I would say we are now. The staff here is now, and so it was very limited to the specific deployment. I can't speak to Spokane and SeaTac. I believe Tacoma is a citywide franchise, and I don't believe they have the aesthetic standards in their franchise. Okay. Um, is this the one that the cities were lobbying at the state level to? Uh, re retain control? This is exactly the topic. Is, okay. And we're not relinquishing control in this franchise right. agreement. Thanks. So this is Verizon, and, and um, is, are we creating, is there any barrier for other uh, service providers in the city? Are we creating any uh, type of barriers or, un, or advantage um, that wouldn't be available to other service providers? We're not creating any barriers or advantages with this uh, to any service provider. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's been two other providers that have now approached the city to put an application in for a small cell franchise, which we will begin negotiating with them once their applications are completed. So this is about improving their quality of service? Yeah, it's about improving the quality of service that the wireless providers are providing today. Okay, so and 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 what's the what's the real what's the public benefit beyond beyond to their customers, just the general public benefit? And I, this is probably more general. I know for franchise agreements, we don't really ask for a lot from those that are requesting it. So what is what, how would you characterize the public benefit? Well, it improves communications between well, all of Well, there's for their customers. That's for their customers. Okay. Well, I'll let Alana answer that. And I'll answer a little bit, and if you want more of an answer, Verizon is sitting in the audience right now. Okay. So with your permission, we could ask them okay. to address it more. Um, what they claim as a public benefit beyond to its own customers is a 911 capabilities. So I believe the statistic they throw out is about 70% or more 911 calls are through cell phones. Um, so that increased ability uh, for, in an emergency, locating individuals because of the GPS mm -hmm. and the increased cell uh, mm -hmm. the, the increased number of cell points that they can, I don't know if the words triangulate, but locate an individual. Um, they believe eventually that when self-driving cars exist, that they will augment the ability for self-driving cars. Um, and then it, this is for their own customers at this point, but the idea of the Internet of Things. So the idea that if you're going to be controlling your uh, alarm from your phone, your lights from your phone, your heat and your air conditioning from your phone, this will enable you to do so at a faster speed. And, and when there are so many more devices using their infrastructure, that they'll be able to do so without having buffering or slowness. And again, if you want, we can ask Verizon to answer more about it. Well, that would be interesting to hear what they have to say, but I'm just, you know, we don't really seem to approach these franchise agreements from really, really defining clearly what the general public benefit is. I mean, it's we got some great territory. It's great space, um, and to make you know, you know it available uh, for for a franchise like that is a tremendous benefit to all, and all of our carriers for all the different franchise agreements that we have. And I'm just trying to. We've never had a lot of conversation. I don't remember having any conversation about really what is 
the benefit to the public for these. I do know that in some circles, um, you know, there's they're asking for a little bit more, uh, um, um, such as um, providing you know high-speed internet access to more people uh, within the community uh, as a benefit of getting a, a franchise agreement. You know, along those lines, um, uh, you know, better 911 services is almost accidental as opposed to a direct benefit to the public. So uh, if, if I may answer. Sure. So uh, in the communities in Washington that I'm aware of, and I represent about 30 cities and I'm in touch with others, um, they don't ask for additional pieces like high-speed internet, et cetera, because under the state statute, we can't charge what's called a franchise fee, whereas we do ask for things like that out of Comcast or Wave, in which we can charge franchise fees and we have some more abilities to ask for additional items. Mm -hmm. And so you don't see those at the monetary consideration, including in kind, in most Washington franchises outside of the cable franchises. And that's controlled by state statute? That's controlled by state statute. In addition, both state and federal law um, require that cities do not effectively prohibit wireless and wireline uh, carriers within their rights of way. So one of the problems we deal with with a franchise is if, it, it's, if we were to grant one, is to say, well, we're not going to grant it, we're going to deny it, and because we don't want small cells in the city of Issaquah at all. So then that type of statement would be effectively prohibiting mm -hmm. Verizon Wireless from using the rights of way for small cell facilities. There's some nuance there, but the idea is, is that if you can't effectively prohibit the usage of the right of way by telecommunications industry. Okay. All right. Okay. So it sounds like uh, so this is new to me. Uh, state statute not allowing really there be any kind of whether it be monetary or in kind public benefit. That's interesting. Um, and um, and also we're not really creating any type of business advantage. This opportunity exists with others within that marketplace. And how many do we have? Have they said how many they think they'll be installing and when? Currently, they only have one area of town that they want to install in, and that's up off the Issaquah Falls City Road and Pine Lake Road, Issaquah Pine Lake Road. That's the initial application where they're going to want to install on PSC poles. Uh, they haven't come to us or indicated how many and where the other ones may be. Uh, it's a function of where their needs are. All right, thank you. Good. All right, so I'm going to kind of summarize in, in simple language and, and tell me if my <coughs> statements are right or wrong. So <coughs> this being the first agreement um, prohibits no other carrier from coming in and getting other agreements. Correct. All right. And so, it, so I imagine anybody else could get a similar thing to this since we put all the work into this one. Um, but it also gives them no real rights because when they want to do something, they have to come to either the city or whosoever facility they want to use and basically work through a standard permitting process for every specific thing they want to do. Correct, though. I would see it as they have a right to use your right-of-way. This franchise grants them the right to use your right-of-way. Mm -hmm. But they can't put anything in it. They yep. cannot attach directly to the right of way. They have to, under this franchise agreement, uh -huh. attach to an existing pole or structure. Right. And they have to get permission from that owner to attach to that structure. And <clears throat> not only that, they have to get permits from the city to attach their small cells to a pole. So PSE right. has to grant permission, and then the city also has to grant permission. For PSE poles or for just a city pole, just be us. Right. Correct. All right. So I'll, I'll, it really gives them the right to ask for something is what it gives them, basically. Yes, but I don't like to tell them that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Comment, Paul? No. no. Okay. Um, and it doesn't hit anybody else, and so we would look at everything else on a case by case basis. Basically, it's the start of, of a process, and assuming we will have others coming in, because um, it's we don't have one cell company that's running the world yet. So. Um. You're on the short list for all of the carriers. Right. With a couple more coming. Okay. And basically, it'd be the same, and they would do the same thing. And. 
All right, so that's all that's given. And, and if I remember right, there, there's a, the $2,500 was the, just the fee and the cost of doing that or something around that. So they're, they're paying the cost of right, our cost and a fee. That's correct. There's a $2,500 application fee, and then they've, uh, they're paying for all of uh, Ogden Murphy's time. Uh, in negotiating this. And all the costs. Right. Okay, so the so $2,500 was the application fee, fee and a deposit. So they deposited, I thought it was another $2,500. And then if we exceed it, then they have to pay those costs too. Right. So they're paying all the direct costs plus the $2,500 application fee. Correct. All right. So um, I think I summed everything up there. I have a couple questions. Okay. Go ahead. So do they um, pay Puget Sound Energy or whoever owns the poles? Yes. So <coughs> if they attach to Puget Sound Energy pole, they pay them. And if the city were to allow them to attach to a city-owned pole, they would pay the city. And if they were to locate outside of the right-of-way on private property, they would pay a private property owner? Yes, and they currently do. Okay. Um, can you have them come up if and, and show us any pictures of what we might be looking at? Did you bring any pictures? <laughs> um, I, I, I have a few. Okay. But uh, what I don't have is something to put up there. I can pass around the initial designs. Sure. Um, okay. While you're looking at that, any other questions pop up? Paul? You're good? No. Okay. Well, they're, they're approximately about 20, I think this is a 17 installation, but I could be wrong off the top of my head, approximately about 20 installations in the initial deployment. About 20 in six blocks. And, and I would expect future deployments. Right. Uh, one last question is just looking at that. Um, would PSC have to do something, or they, they're not forced into it? If they want to use one of their poles, they, they don't have to agree to it? Or there, is there, there a pressure to do, for them to do so? Both. There are um, some federal regulations related and state regulations related to the usage of their utility poles, so requiring them to, in some situations to allow attachments to their poles. Um, PSC is working in a friendly manner with the carriers. Okay. Okay. And uh, say, for example, they came up with a place that doesn't have existing facilities, uh, they could apply for that also under this agreement to put in the structure itself, or that is absolutely not allowed? That currently in this agreement is not allowed. Uh, it, it was a big negotiation point, and it was basically a point that we didn't feel the city was ready to make a decision on. And so if they wanted to cite small cell facilities in the city of Issaquah at this moment in time, it was something that it should go on existing infrastructure. And then once planning, public works, and other administration and the council decide otherwise, um, they can move forward with possibly an amendment. Okay, thank you. Anything else? I think more questions. More. Okay. So we have children in some parts of town, our, plant, our codes say that we are undergrounding power and eliminating power. So how does that, how, does, how do these two pieces go together? If we underground power, does it mean we lose an opportunity to have these new utilities? That was the big question mark, and why we hadn't been able to come to a decision on new structures in the right of way without a code revision to determine how that would look. Um, and so in places that are underground electric electrical facilities, there are essentially two options. One is attached to a city-owned pole. Um, if the city were to grant that permission. The problem even with attaching to a city-owned pole in the city of Issaquah is that the poles in many of your underground neighborhoods are about 15 feet high, and these facilities need infrastructure that's about 25 to 30 feet high. So it's not not necessarily workable to attach to a city-owned pole. And so then the conversations are, well, what are some creative design standards that we can come up with to remedy this problem? And at this point, neither the industry, nor the city of Issaquah, nor frankly any other city have really come up with a great design standard. I say any other city. Denver has one. Um, I don't know if it's something that the city of Issaquah would want or not. But there's very few cities that have figured out that problem. And, and to follow up on your question, so say they do mount on, on a pole somewhere and then that's an area we want to underground things. How would we deal with that? There's uh, strict provisions in here in this franchise that requires relocation. 
So just like your electrical facilities or Comcast, just like any other facility attached to that pole, they would have to relocate unless the city for some reason decided to say otherwise. So the other utilities though, underground. The other utilities underground, although most franchises say that they can relocate first, typically they underground because they can't really relocate in order to get the service where they want. So these mini, whatever they're called, they could not go underground, so they could actually tie our hands in terms of... No, they're required to relocate. So if the pole goes away, they have to figure out where they're going to relocate. So the service level would go down or they'd have to find a private place Correct. to go Okay. Okay, so it sounds like we pretty much have control of things at, at this point. I like to think so. Okay, all right. So with that, um, well, question. Yes, go ahead. Just Paul. Look quickly looking through these drawings, are these drawings of all like the existing PSC poles? I believe those are existing PSE poles. Because they look, they're not, um, I'm not familiar with the power lines along those corridors, but these are not necessarily look like the poles that are serving the power to residential units. This is more of a transmission line. Those are transmission lines. They're the high voltage lines uh, that go along that corridor. Those poles, the wires are the carrying voltages that you probably would not be able to underground. Right, that's, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so, that, okay, all right. That's what all of these are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So the recommendation is to send this back to the full council on next meeting, December 4th. Public. Um, Thanks. Okay. So before we do that, any public comments? Can we discuss a little bit before we talk about sending it on? Because I have some concerns. Sure, that's what I was asking for. Okay, so there's a couple of things. Um, one is it's a new use of the right of way. And I get the sense in listening that we don't actually know what we're agreeing to yet because it's a brand new use. Um, I liked Paul's question about what's the community benefit to this. Well, it sounds like if we have a neighborhood with underground, we're not going to see these there. So there isn't. A, there are certain areas in the city with underground power where this is not likely to happen. And so, to me, I'd actually there's a couple of things I'd like to see. I'd like to see more information on the aesthetics to understand what they're going to look like. Like. I'd like to know um, why Bellevue did location specific, because if they had rationale for saying it can be here but not here, I want to understand what that is. And I also think that from a city point of view, we know where we have the power above and below ground. Show me where these could show up, because if there's a big swath of our city where we're never going to get advantage of this and a small trunk line out in an edge, um, I don't know. I think we should think about it more. So I, I don't think I have enough information yet. I think it's a big deal to allow something new into your right away. I think you ought to understand what it is. We ought to understand what it is. I don't have a good understanding of it. So I would like, those are the additional pieces of information I'd like to see. And I think aesthetics needs to be included in the agenda bill. Um, that's where my head is. Any more, Paul? I don't have anything to add, but uh, um, I'll agree with Mary Lou in that uh, let's, I think this is something new, so let's get a little bit, let's get this additional information. I'm okay with that. Okay, so if we want to do that, that would roll it into next month's infrastructure committee meeting and uh, timing and then do that. So you have a concern over there, it looks like. Um, with the permission of the council here, I can answer some of those questions. Where if you want. The, the, which neighborhoods may not be served by this in town? Well, I, I, so I took notes on your questions and I, I probably answer sure. all three of them, if it, or at least attempt to answer them and then you just decide from there if that's allowed. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, ahead, so let's start with Bellevue for a second because I was involved with the Bellevue project. The reason why they chose three specific locations is because Verizon identified three specific locations. It wasn't that Bellevue chose these areas. Verizon approached 
the city of Bellevue and said, here are three areas that we would like to build out and as our initial deployment. And Bellevue said okay to that. So it, it, it wasn't that Bellevue, that, that Verizon said these are the only areas that we're going to serve or that Bellevue said these are the only areas you're going to serve. It was just this is our first initial deployment and we want to get something out there and get built out there. And um, in two of the three areas, it was PSE owned facilities. Um, the third area is the downtown area. I don't, I know that that has not finished. Well, they haven't even finished the lease on those city owned poles yet. So it could be a while before those are built out. So that's, it, it, there's not some great rationale in Bellevue, unfortunately. It was just. It's okay to ask questions. Yeah, please. So why wouldn't we just allow them to use the locations they've asked for now so that we just limit it to what they've asked for instead of giving them access to the whole city in the first shot? The city standard franchise agreement does a citywide franchise for wireline, wireless, and then the idea is is that it kicks over to staff with either the public works department or the planning department to then help with the aesthetics and figuring out the siting and figuring out what works. Part of the benefit of that is that your staff understands which poles will can hold these facilities, which poles are going away, for example. And we've had a meeting once where AT&T said, well, we're interested in these poles and the, the staff understood that there's going to be a redevelopment in that area. So uh, there's there's the benefit of trusting that the staff members can help identify what the best routes are. And a problem with doing only an area of the city is then, then they have to come back to council again and ask for an amendment and ask for the specific deployment. That typically takes at least 120 days. So that causes a, a barrier to entry, essentially, in a very long amount of time before they can site another facility in another location. Um, so that's kind of the reason for the citywide. And, and to add to that, you made a comment earlier about you know what neighborhoods would not receive. By providing a citywide, we're providing opportunity for them to look citywide in as much area as they possibly can where they have gaps of service and things like that. So we're not having to come back to council every time and amend the franchise agreement. So we're trying to provide that opportunity but yet in a very restrictive way of where they can place them, you know, on what poles and things like that. And it just made it more administratively efficient and service provision efficient. That's why we chose citywide as well, is what Alana was talking about. And then to answer your questions about the underground areas, I don't think they're going to see small cells today or in 60 days from now, but I do, I think eventually the city and the carriers will figure out a plan to make sure that those areas get the service that they need. And you're right, it, it, we don't have that right now. One of the issues will be is if you keep waiting till you figure out those plans, it, you're going to bump up against at least another year. I mean, when you think about all the different neighborhoods and all the different design standards within those neighborhoods within the city of Issaquah. So to make sure that you cover the entire area of Issaquah and meet the unique needs of all of those neighborhoods it would be fairly difficult and time consuming to both council and staff. And so I think that the city will figure that out, the city staff and the council, but um, I, I do believe that eventually you will see service there in, what, in some form or another. It may not be small cell, it may be some other type of technology. Thanks, actually, that's helpful um, a little bit. <laughs> it still feels to me like we don't know what this is, we don't know what it looks like. It's not going underground, it's going to be visible. I think I want to know what it looks like. Um, that was a pretty small area for 20 installations. Um, you know, I think I'm not ready to say it's okay to go citywide with something we don't know just because it's administratively easier or there's a 120 day delay. Right now they're not allowed in at all. This would allow their project to go forward. Uh, I don't know, just not comfortable saying, go ahead, you get our whole city so that you can pick and choose where to put it, even though we don't have any skin in the game to say this is an underserved area. Yeah, but that's an underground power area, it's not coming. So I don't actually feel like we have much control at all over improved service. We'll get improved service where they want to provide improved service, and that's where there's polls. So I'm actually still want to see some more information on aesthetics, 
I'd like to understand if there are jurisdictions that handle this differently, which you explained Bellevue did. I actually like the idea of one project and not a citywide agreement right out of the gate. You know the same place, Paul? Did provoke another question. I'm just doing a little quick research online and I see, and this is just from Wikipedia, so it's consider the source. <laughs> uh, and um, that they are, um, they have a range of 10 meters to a few kilometers. And I look at that design and it's just along a couple corridors. So I'm assuming it's just really servicing vehicles along those that those two roadways. So I think Verizon says their range is about 300 to 500 feet. Excuse me, 500 to 1,000 okay. feet. Okay. Um, it, so one of the fundamental differences between small cell and macro facilities is the macro facility is designed to provide coverage. So if you have the macro facility, your phone works. What the small cell does is it augments that coverage, but specifically it augments the capacity. It means not that your telephone as you dial a number works, means that you can download Netflix faster and stream video or run your self-driving car or Facebook or those pieces. It's the idea that the capacity of the number of phones that are connected in the system in that area can just get faster service. So it's not that those phones don't have service today or an area doesn't have service. It's that this is going to augment that service. And if by them, if, if they put these small cells on a, a, any given tower, does that preclude any other wireless infrastructure company to use the same tower? So that there's a technological question to that and a city decision question to answer to that. Technologically, sometimes the answer is no, that, that they cannot co-locate. That, that may or may not change or vary depending on the deployment or the carrier. Um, many city councils do not want more than one small cell facility per pole. And so uh, when they come to doing code revisions, they actually restrict what's called a co-location. Why? Aesthetics. So if you co-locate, imagine if you've got two antennas from Verizon and now another two or three antennas from AT&T, that aesthetically may seem unbalanced or seem ugly on a pole, plus the equipment shelter on the pole. Yeah, so it's interesting. So the amount, it does, there is a aesthetic question at a certain level. And, uh, you know, so, so actually my greatest, and it, it's my greatest, it's not great, but it's, it's my greatest concern is just, I'm not sure yet that we wouldn't be creating by um, uh, an, an unfair market advantage to just one provider. I'm not sure that that, because I just looked at that design there, and I don't know how many poles that is of, out of the ones that are there, and you're saying basically nobody else could ever uh, compete in that space with that level of capacity. That's what, or is that, is that, that seems possible to me, based upon what you just said. At some point, there may be all the poles are used. I don't have an idea of how many poles you have there, but these are the providers that have been competing with each other for decades now, mm -hmm. and they understand this issue. And so Verizon may be first, first one in the gate here in Issaquah, and AT&T might be the first one in Renton. And, and so they understand how that, that all works, and they're, they're driven by their own business needs as to when they're going to apply. Yeah, and then let me say it a different way. I, I, I understand what you're saying. It's just that um, would, with this agreement, would we be potentially um, kind of creating almost like a pseudo uh, single provider market space in certain areas. Nobody else could ever can come in and compete. compete. I don't, in certain geographic areas. I, I don't believe so. Again, I don't know your specific polls, but the answer to that would be, well, okay, there's no more polls here, so what other infrastructure can you attach to? Are there low-grade um, buildings that you can attach to, and those typically allow co-location. Are there city lights that you can attach to? Could you build a macro facility to serve the same purpose? So I think that if and when you get there, there are other potential opportunities that you would look at. And then 
apparent, you know, at some point maybe, well, maybe we need a new light pole in a certain area or a new utility pole. Maybe can they cite a new pole to get there? I think it would take a while before you tapped out all of your infrastructure. You don't look convinced. <laughs> no, I think, I'm just thinking, just because, you know, if you say additional power infrastructure is required, then it's more like, um, yeah, and then there's just this growing forest of towers. <laughs> So, yeah, let me throw in, um, just because uh, as I didn't get a chance to really look at the plans there. So I, I think for me, we're definitely missing what this thing really looks like. I mean, I was there and haven't seen a picture of anything yet at all. And that that's a big missing feature. And when you add the fact that th there may be like 500 feet apart, that brings a whole nother level of a whole lot of th lot very close together. Like I said, and I didn't, again, I didn't get a chance to look at it because it was on the spot here, but 20 poles in, in one, there are 20 spots in very one little short place. So I think that brings in another uh, piece of that as well for me. Go ahead, Marilyn. Thanks. So just listen. Just listening to um, Bill and Paul talk, what strikes me that we're missing here, and this is what I hear in the questions, is that the agenda bill itself just says, here's an agreement. What is not apparent at all is what the policy choices are in that agreement. And what I would like to see come back is a memo that stop, talks what they are. In terms of aesthetics, we are not looking at aesthetics at all. I'd like to know what other cities do, and I still may choose not to go with any sort of aesthetic criteria. They're not recreating a monopoly. What have other jurisdictions done about that? And even just letting us know that we're creating that, that what this says is we'll probably just have one vendor on most of our polls. Because if, if, does it say in, where does it, where, as a city, are we saying they can have multiple people on, multiple um, suppliers on polls, or what is this agreement that we're signing telling us? We're not precluding multiple providers on the poll. That becomes a technical issue with the uh, providers, the wireless providers. And as more applications come in for franchises and you grant franchises there, that provides the next wireless provider to, the right to be in the right of way as well. We're not precluding co-location. That becomes a technical issue between the uh, carriers and the poll owners. Uh, that's not, you know, so what I, yeah, I guess what I want, Sheldon, is I'd like to see that in writing. I'd like to see you guys tell us what we're approving. Um, I'm still in favor of looking at why we wouldn't go with one application first. Um, also, just to clarify, this is for mobile users, not residential or, or business users. The, the reach of this network is really for those who are in the um, corridor? It's for cell phone usage. Right, so you have to live within 500 feet or 1,000 feet to benefit from it or be driving down the road? I believe so. Okay. Uh, Gregor? You're, you're welcome to come up. That's what you're here for? Yes. Yeah, or you can just sit there and share a mic with you, whatever you want to do. my address and everything like that. No. Okay. State, state your name, please. Okay, uh, Gregor Gadbaugh with Verizon. Thank you. Um, all right, so sorry, I was a lot of questions that were being asked I wanted to answer. Um, so as far as uh, our deployment is concerned, where we need cells doesn't necessarily mean that's where our competition needs cells. It all depends on variables as far as our RF engineers determining, you know, if we have capacity constraint in a certain area, uh, and that could be completely different than, than say, at and and T-Mobile. Uh, as far as co-location, PSE does not allow us to co-locate. So on any PSE poll, you will only have one carrier. Uh, and right now that's what we're looking at is PSE poles. Uh, as far as the distance that they get deployed, it depends on the size of the radio. We have you know, as small as a five watt radio and up to a 20 watt radio. The higher the, the watt radio, the further it can cover. Uh, the lower, the less, the less distance it covers. So one of the puts and takes as far as deploying is, we can go with smaller radios which look better, but then you may need more because they don't cover as far. Um, and we don't necessarily need to have one on every street corner. It ultimately just depends on uh, where we need to put them. And the biggest piece as far as small cells is, is to deal with, it does help in coverage, absolutely, but it's capacity because usage, data usage, phones, tablets, it's going up exponentially, it's gonna continue 
continue to go up, and that's what we're trying to do is augment that usage. Um, one thing to be aware of is, again, we have our macros. They provide cell service, texting calls, uh, their battery backup, and they have uh, uh, or generator. Um, with the small cells, we're actually not deploying them with a the battery backup because we want to reduce the amount of equipment in the right of way. Um, but if should the power go out and our small cells go down, the macros will still be there. People can still call. They can still text. Uh, they just won't be able to stream data, like movies or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Questions. Did you have any other? And no, I was trying to remember. I, there was a bunch yeah, of we have nothing aesthetics of what these even look like, though. There's, right. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, will work very closely with the city as far as the aesthetics. We know that there's sensitive areas that have more ornate, uh, you know, situ if we're on light standards. Uh, you know, we but we work very closely with the city to make sure because we color the match the pole. Uh, we have some stealthing that we can do to make it less noticeable. Uh, we have a lot of vendors that we work with that are constantly coming up with new creative ways to make them look better. Um, I wasn't aware that I would have needed some, I uh, would have brought them with me. I apologize for that. As far as the actual, some of the, some of the examples we have for, for our, what we've done. And one last question. Now, if I remember right, you said they need to be like at least 25 feet up. So pretty much. Yes. F uh, for us, the, the best uh, height is anywhere from 25 to 40 feet. I want to comment on the aesthetics for a second. One of the big pieces to think about on aesthetics is that that's one of the reasons why we were clear that that you know the PSC poles here in the initial deployment. Okay, that's fine. But that in our conversations with them right now, it's if you're going to do something other than a PSC pole deployment, we really need to come and talk to the planning department and really need to discuss it. And if it's on a city-owned pole, which my understanding would be the majority of the non-PSC wooden poles, that actually has to come back for council approval to agree to rent the poles. So some of those aesthetic questions on city-owned standards would have to come back to council on, on that type of agreement. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning, figuring out the aesthetics for every neighborhood and what that would be on each poll would be quite difficult and premature without knowing if that neighborhood already has sufficient coverage from the, and capacity from the macro facilities. Okay, so, Back in just one moment, January of this year, uh, the City Council had a presentation which I just pulled up. Uh, if you give me a moment, I can pull it up on there because it does show pictures of aesthetics of what these facilities would look like. So if you bear with me a moment, I can pull that up. Yes, we'll bear with you. address the question about what other cities are doing sure. while he does this? Any information you have, sure. So I, I, I want to be honest about this, that there's, you know, in Washington State, there's not that many cities that have, been, have received a complete application from a carrier. So of the 30 cities that I represent, two, uh, two, well, and Bellevue, because they've already passed their franchise, but two have received a complete application from a carrier. Um, now, as I said, Spokane has it, SeaTac has it, there are other cities that are in, in the process. But um, the barrier is you have to receive a complete application. The carrier has to say, we need to site in your area. And so it's going to be difficult within Washington State to say, what are other cities doing? They're trying to figure it out. Skinny pigs. Yep, I can talk to this presentation. So what you see in the first picture is a Verizon deployment on a Seattle City light pole. At the top are antennas, and the bottom there are two boxes. One's a radio box and one's a power disconnect. In the exterior to the pole are two conduits. One conduit holds fiber, the other conduit holds power. The conduits have to be approximately five inches off the pole due to the National Electric Safety Code, and they have to be separated, the power and the fiber. This is an up-close picture, but it's somewhat similar, I think, Gregor, to what the PSC pole looks, will look like as well. Correct, okay. So, and it's a Seattle City Light installment. Yep. 
This was exactly what I just described. <laughs> This is a clear wire uh, deployment outside of Washington State. Uh, no, it says at the top Washington, doesn't it? I don't know where this clear wire deployment is, but it, it's not one that I'm seeing now in really? any applications. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even know Redmond had a clear wire deployment. Um, but that's a macro facility, not a uh, small cell facility. This is micro cell. It's, um, it says micro cell, but it's considered in the city of Redmond a macro facility. Sure. Okay. This also appears to be a macro facility in the right of way. It's an AT&T pool. I don't believe it's in Washington State. And I can tell it's probably a macro facility because you can see the equipment off to the side in the green area um, and the size of the antennas. So the, as I mentioned before, the antennas need to be three cubic feet. Those appear to be much larger than that. This. Um, Looks like it's a California facility, but it would qualify, I believe, as a small cell facility. The left one might be Portland. Um, so this is a side bracket mount facility with a cylinder attachment. I have seen photo simulations of this, but most cities I've worked with don't want this type of deployment. Um, and it may depend on the pole owner. PSC will allow it, but they also allow and like the flush mounted antenna um, rather than the side bracketed cylinder. So let me ask a question about that. Um, if it's on a PSC pole and they allow something that's unesthetically, un it's aesthetically unattractive, they get to do it? No. Because we have aesthetics in ours that say they can't. They still have to apply for a planning permit here, and so the agreement the agreement says that they can't. The agreement says they have to apply for a planning permit. So our planning permits specifically say what's allowed and not allowed, and that's not allowed. The, the planning permit would say what is or what is not allowed. Because they have they not have determined it, yet. Have it, so our planning department has no code that they can say you can't do that. Just have to hope that they say, I don't like that when it's ugly. They're involved with this process, so they they are thinking a lot about what this should look like aesthetically. But we do not but have code. The code does not specifically say the aesthetic standards yet. Okay, so um, I can capsulate here. Uh, I think we have some. Uh, need for more information. I don't think anybody here, Paul, I'm speaking for you, uh, <laughs> is ready to pass this on to council or you want to get some more? Because I think we have some, some fears of, of what, even though it sounds like we have a fair amount of control of what comes, we don't know what's coming. And I think that's the, uh, the fear factor. And, and for myself, that uh, there could be a lot of these. That's It's not just one, but if you're talking 500 feet apart, that could be a lot um, throughout the city. So that's, I think, where the fear is. I'm not sure. You heard a lot of the questions, I think, and and I'm not sure exactly how to say what you need to bring back, but it sounds that's what I'm hearing from the three of us, is that we want something more brought back before we want to send it on to council. That, can you say anything else to that? Yeah, I actually just want some time to think about it a little bit more. You know, in your locations where you have it right now, where you're proposing it, how many how many macro cells does it serve in, with those on those two roadways? You're asking how many macro cells we currently have? Well, in, that these small cells mm -hmm. would be augmenting. Uh, I believe we have right now identified 18 nodes, which when we say a node, that's a small cell. However, uh, of those, some are actually in the city of Sammamish, so it would be less than 18 that we're looking at right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, and so we saw the picture we saw earlier of, of, of you call it a macro, right? How many do you have in that area? Uh, I don't know, but I can find out. I mean, what would you guess? I couldn't even guess. I'm just I, trying to get a sense of right. how much additional equipment, additional equipment on the roadway, on the furniture, it would be. So, so currently, in 
Issaquah, Verizon, Shall don't correct me if I'm wrong, Verizon does not have any macro facilities in your right of way. They do have macro facilities on city owned property in which you receive rent from those facilities. But they don't currently have any macro facilities in your right of way. I think Sprint does. Sprint has one. Has one and, that, and Clearwire and that's the area that you annex from King County. So um, currently you don't see macro facilities in the right of way. Currently they're discouraged, I believe, from the right of way. Um, and so you, I don't think that unless the code were to change, you would see that. Um, and I, I do have a question about okay. direction oh, as, as we go forward because, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so you, though you showed us photos, uh, ones that were in a right of way. No, those were not in your right of way. So the, not in ours, but I mean the example photos. Those photos were photos of facilities in other rights of way. And right, what I mean. we skipped over in that presentation was part of the point of that presentation. The point of that presentation was to gear the council up for lobbying efforts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And just, so, just to, 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 well, no, to prevent <laughs> right. the, loss the loss of control. And so those pictures were chosen to encourage the city council to lobby against what was initially proposed at the state legislature. So you know, they were not the prettiest pictures of deployments. Yeah, that, that's fine. Again, what I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of, um, cause I, I'm not a, I don't know, I don't know the engineering in this. And you talk about these macro cells or, and, or what I would just call a tower, I guess. And um, you know, how many, you own as a horizon own right now that are because I'm, I'm reading that these things actually you said that they augment what's already there they use the same uh, radio frequencies they're just they create create more capacity and probably reliability in the service in a given area they're augmenting a supercell or macro cell so is this is this 10 times more equipment is it 20 times more equipment or yeah, with macros, uh, you know, they're anywhere from 80 to 120 feet, and they can cover up to 10 miles. Um, and you can only have so many macros within distance of each other before they interfere. And that's one of the nice things about small cells is because they operate at such a lower power and at such a lower level that they don't interfere with the macro. So we, it's, a, it's a solution to help increase capacity, sometimes coverage, um, without having to, and because we can't get another macro in that area, we always want to try to do a macro first because it's easier um, and it doesn't mm -hmm. take as much time. Mm -hmm. um, but then we look at small cells as the, the next uh, avenue. And then as far as deployment's concerned, we always try to go with utility first, then light standards, then um, uh, street or uh, traffic signals, and then ultimately to you know putting our own pole in the ground. I mean, putting our own pole in the ground is the the last thing we do mm -hmm. if we want to try to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. Answer your question. Yeah, I did. I was just trying to get, and regardless of the aesthetics of the photos that you showed, it just made me realize we have existing equipment on the ground, right? And and so this and and I don't I don't know how much that is or where it is. And this is going to bring more into our geographic area. How much more of that clutter are we talking about? And it sounds like, actually, the macro cells are often are are not. There's just not very many of them. Yeah, there's there's not that many, but then again, because the capacity of them is so vast and they yeah. cover such a large area, yeah. um, but then that, at one point that capacity gets constrained, yeah, um, and then we just don't have the you know, ability to put another macro in because it would start interfering with the other ones. Mm -hmm. So I, if it's okay, I would like some direction and, and inform you of a few other things. So okay. the first is under state statute, we have 120 days in which to approve or deny a franchise. Mm -hmm. And there's some uh, ability to extend that timeline due to council meetings, which we did. So we hit the 120 day marker, um, but, but we are within the law because we had been scheduled for council meetings. Um, it's possible that Verizon says, we're not going to renegotiate this. You either have to approve or deny this franchise. So they may say that, and then it may have to come back to council, and council makes a decision as to whether or not to approve or deny it. I'm hopeful that that might not be the situation. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is saying is we need more information. But one of the other pieces I heard from you is a question about why not do a specific area. And that's something I want some guidance on here. 
if this was a franchise that was only for a the initial deployment, would there be a different thought process here? So for me, if this had come with one installation, with that set of drawings, with aesthetics and what it looked like, an accompanying code language that says we're going to get what we think, there wouldn't have been an issue for me tonight. It's because I have no idea what this looks like, where else it's going to go, what neighborhoods, what residential aesthetic impact it's going to have, and I have no code that says that they're not going to build something ugly. So if it has code, if it was one site, um, I don't think I'd have an issue with it. And, and aesthetic drawings are what it's going to look like, but too much of that is missing. So is, there's a lot of unknowns here. This is a new thing in the right of way, and I don't understand it very well. And so one touch and pushing up, saying that you're pushing up against 120 days, it's the first time we've seen it. Should have brought it six months earlier. I mean, that's the problem. You can't just come one time and say, this is it, take it or leave it. Um, we need to understand what it is. I don't get it. And I'm not ready to say, yes, this can be citywide, not now. So my question back, I guess mainly the two of you, is <clears throat> with what you've heard, could you put something together, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that you think could address all these issues for the next in infrastructure meeting? I can give you the date on that, but, um, and, and get us better educated on that so we'd feel better with what we're doing since it is a brand new thing. It is, it is an unknown. Um, and, and would that work? So, Again, I can't speak for Verizon and negotiations and things like that. He can't either. Sorry. <laughs> he's, he's not their lawyer and, and didn't, he doesn't have that authority. I'm going to just speak for Gregor because I've known him long enough now. But um, the one piece of what was just said to me that would be a problem, honestly, is creating code because code has a process and it's planning code, which means it has to go to the planning commission. It is a long process and it is not something that would be able to be done within 120 days or maybe even within a six month time period. This is a project that the city has been considering, I mean, at least since January when you saw that, but, but longer than that. The city's participated, the city staff has participated in meetings um, and and with other cities as well to, to discuss how are we going to look at deployment and, and what are aesthetics going to look like and what can be acceptable and what can't be acceptable and what could be acceptable on a preliminary basis, you know, citing on PSE polls is what most cities are feeling more comfortable with. But I, I don't think we could get a, a code provision passed within a, any reasonable period of time because I think it, it, it's going to require a lot more work than, than the 120 days time gap or even what we can ask Verizon to toll for. Yes. Okay, let me, um, <clears throat> and then let me just state, I guess, going back to that and the presentation that you pulled up was up until this point in time, people have geared us to, this is something we're gonna have to fight against. It's Totally out of our, you know, against the state legislature doing something that would be totally out of our control, have no ability to control what it looks like or where it is. And so we're, we've been geared to this, as you said, that presentation was helped to gear us against that. Now, all of a sudden, it, it got turned around. So so there's there's a little bit of stuff you have to sort, sort through when, you, when you're going down this street and all of a sudden you make a hard right turn. Um, so I think that's creating some of that angst because that's where we were, uh, where you know the industry went. They tried to go around that way and it didn't work. Um, and I'm glad it didn't. So uh, now, we're, now we're sitting here trying to do it individually and we want to make sure we do it right. And, and when you say it's good for the whole city and it's going to be there and there's no, I say there's you know, nothing but good staff judgment to back it up. We have good staff and they have good judgment, but I don't know if we want to put that much burden on them at this point in time with a brand new thing that we don't totally understand ourselves. Go ahead. Thanks, sis. Um, so we've had experience recently with bad code giving us bad outcomes, so not having any code at all doesn't give me a lot of confidence. If there's a way for you to go away and add something into the franchise agreement that would relieve our concern over aesthetics, go ahead and do it. Um, maybe that can be in there until code is developed. But to have nothing is, is a good answer. Not having code is not a good answer. We have to have some certainty on it. 
So that's a lot of rambling, <laughs> but I'm hoping we've got enough there. Um, unless you want to add anything else, Paul, to, to yeah, kind of I'll represent simply that. Add, um, it feels significant to me to, to citywide franchise first time something new that's just emerging into the marketplace. And this is really the first and only opportunity we've ever had to talk about it or think about it. And I appreciate all the information. You're obviously very knowledgeable. Um, if there's no compelling reason to to move it this evening, then you know I would just I just want some more time to think about it. And, and if that's available, and then you know I have a little bit more time to to understand this a little bit better. I think uh, probably even come up. Um, with some more questions, I have some. I have access to staff, or perhaps I have access to you. Um, you know, I like the idea of innovation and in providing better service for people. I mean, that that's good. That, that's okay. It's it's a business. It's a for-profit business. I get all of that. It is our right away, and I just want to be very careful. I just feel like a very um, I, of an obligation as a steward of the right away to make sure that we do something new like this, uh, that we're doing the right thing. Um, and I'm not assuming here that this, there's anything evil or wrong here. That's not my assumption at all. It's just new. It's significant. First time we talked about it. Kind of a little bit more time to think about it. We come back next month. Uh, I'd love to be able to settle it one way or the other. And I would okay. just throw out that the 120 days you're talking about, um, it, both partners, I'm assuming, can take as much time as they want by agreement. That's just trying to force things to, to do something. So if one partner wants to force a point, they're, they're always welcome to do that. But I'm hoping this would be a cooperative thing and, and continue to work together on that. That would be my hope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Sorry. so does that Great. cover it all for us? All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you for stepping up and answering those those questions you can. And, uh, and thanks for all your time on working on that agreement. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. With that done, uh, next up we have AB 7486, Newport Way, SR 900 to Southeast 54th Corridor Concept. I think we have a number of folks here that are going to be talking to us and presenting things here. We've talked a little bit about it Monday night at the uh, work session as well, so we're going to dive in a little deeper here. All right, thank you very much. Right. So I'll just, we have a couple, I'm going to have everybody who's grabbing a microphone just introduce themselves quickly so we know who's here officially yeah. rather than, rather than me saying your names. So Brianne Ross, a senior transportation engineer for our public works department here at the city. Okay. Not sure if this is on or not, but this is uh, Michael Lapham from KPG. And then we have Cecily Asato, who is also with KPG, who will be joining us shortly. And Kurt Seaman, transportation manager. <laughs> yeah. city. Great. All right. Okay. So, Take off. great. Um, we're here to talk about our Newport Way corridor project again. And um, want to remind everyone that, that this is a, a corridor concept. It's the 10% design level. It includes the cross section or the, the various design elements um, in the corridor as well as the intersections and that's what we're considering tonight. Um, we anticipate having an additional two years of design process to get into the details of design being like roadway elevations and walls, utilities, um, specific pedestrian crossing treatments, uh, future transit, school bus stop locations, and, and corridor aesthetics. So what we're at now really truly is this preliminary planning level design, um, and, and we want to make sure that we have this as a starting point, being the, the cross section of the roadway and then the intersection controls that have been established in the design report, and, and then be able to design, get into the details of design design as the next phase. So um, just as a, a note, we have similar same slides as, as Monday night, but we're going to hopefully um, provide some new information to go with them. And then uh, we're hoping that after tonight we return to council on Monday, December 4th. 
So the project goals, um, our corridor concept accomplishes these goals by providing continuous sidewalk, continuous multi-use path, which appeals to a broad range of bicyclists, uh, continuous bike lanes, which appeals more to the commuter cyclists, turn lanes, which improve uh, vehicle access and accommodate future traffic, and also changing the character of the roadway um, to be more of an urban neighborhood type road versus the, the old rural highway and minimizing the roadway width to maintain as much of the hillside environmental areas and native trees as possible. So uh, we have our, our lovely pilot public engagement process and um, this is the first major corridor project to, to use our, our new public engagement process. And uh, I think that we can say it, it has been successful because about a year ago, uh, at this time, there was a meeting in Tibbetts Manor about Newport Way. And it was filled with standing room only. And there were a lot of really upset residents there. Um, and they were upset about the developments, they were upset about traffic congestion and feeling like their frustrations with what was happening had not been heard by staff and council and the, um, the community. So um, I would say that thank you to everybody in, that's been involved in this project. We've had great um, public support and great public involvement, which has taken time um, from their personal lives. And that's resulted in really good feedback that we've received. And then we've also had a lot of staff time and council time and administration time and, and our consultants. And taking this formal process has come to a point where here we are and, and we still certainly have some residents with some some concerns, but but we don't have a packed room, <laughs> um, and I think that that's a lot of um, progress. And so um, we have had a lot of opportunity to listen to our residents, um, also talk about some of the educational components behind the engineering solutions we're looking at and the benefits of the project. And and the public really has been a part of the decision making process. So. Um, this has really truly been an exercise in balancing priorities. Um, we have had folks that have been interested in, in keeping Newport Way a two-lane roadway. And we have also had residents interested in keeping New, or in making Newport Way a five-lane roadway. And so that's what we've encountered with every decision that we've made. And in striking the balance to find the best um, corridor concept possible for this area and, and, and balancing those priorities for, for all residents. So, um, again, this is, as people left our most recent uh, neighborhood meeting, they were given a sticker and we've asked that, you know, we asked them, are we, are we going in the right direction or are we not? Do we need to turn around and, and try again? And, and I think there's, I mean, there's clearly consensus that, that we are heading in the right direction and that's, that is due to, um, to the level of engagement that, that they've been involved in. Yeah, uh, we start. We started our traffic analysis by analyzing existing conditions um, in the corridor. Uh, Newport Way is a minor arterial, and it carries about 10,000 people each weekday, 10,000 vehicles each weekday. And one of the challenges of the corridor today is that uh, during peak travel times, during the morning and the afternoon, uh, can be difficult uh, to access the side streets and driveways, uh, making left turns into and out of those places. Um, yeah, the main takeaway, uh, we then went from existing conditions uh, to 2040 conditions. Uh, the main takeaway is that a three-lane section uh, can accommodate uh, the projected traffic volumes out there over the next 23 years going to 2040. Um, we, we're looking at adding um, left turn lane to side streets and driveways and locations where we do not have uh, need for access to install a center median. And our goal behind this is to throughout the day uh, moderate the traffic or calm the traffic to reasonable speeds, but on the other hand, also maintain the travel speeds uh, during the busy times of day as well. As Brian mentioned, part of the part of our goal is changing the character of the roadway and making it a, a calmer place for people and pedestrians to integrate. Um, 
what you see out here at the preferred concept is going to completely change what the existing concept is. Our, the existing roadway has no, has no shoulders, no curbs. Um, the verticality will slow traffic down. We really are making it a pedestrian, multimodal corridor. Um, as Brianne mentioned, we'll have a continuous bike facility um, based on the NACTO, which is the National Association of City Transportation and Officials. Uh, we've designed the bike lanes through here, which is appropriate for a roadway that's less than 35 miles per hour. It provides direct access for uh, roadway biker commuters. And yet we're pairing it with a shared use trail or a multi-purpose trail for people of all levels. So children and families, it's really gonna encourage people to start walking, um, you know, using that Mountain Sounds Greenway and did that really continuous uh, network of trail. Yeah, for moving from the cross section of the corridor into a more specific uh, intersection by intersection, we've been looking at improvements to enhance vehicle access, again, moderate the traffic speeds, and facilitate uh, safe pedestrian crossings. So we went intersection by intersection, um, doing a close examination of what we think the best uh, treatments are out there, considering all these uh, various needs. Uh, we looked at uh, various unsignalized intersections, uh, roundabouts, traffic signals, uh, and always stop uh, throughout the corridor. And we did select um, a roundabout. Uh, the developer's currently uh, designing one at the gateway apartments uh, entrance and uh, also the main entrance to Spyglass as well. And here, um, I'm happy to say uh, last time, some of these graphics uh, weren't as clear, a little, some of the white was bleeding onto white. Uh, so um, yeah, so much cleaner for you folks to see tonight. Um, this is an example of what we call a flying T that helps left turn access uh, into and out of intersections, and this can only be used at locations where there's a three-legged intersection. Uh, we have a successful example out in the corridor today, uh, just to the west of 54th Avenue or 54th Street, and that's at the Montro entrance there. So you can see the top images of that, and then the low, lower image is showing um, one that would could be at 54th, and the main benefit is you can do a two-stage left turn out of the uh, side street uh, to pull into the refuge slash acceleration lane you can see there, and then complete your turn by uh, yielding to the second direction of traffic. So part of the way of changing the character of the roadway and slowing speeds down and making it into more of a neighborhood corridor is doing a raised intersection. And this paired along with the with the roundabout gateway, having another raised intersection at Pinecone, sorry, Pinecone and at the King County Trailhead um, with the flying T intersections will actually all work together with the medians to calm traffic and make it a better corridor for both, again, drivers and pedestrians alike. Yeah, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, this is the existing, uh, or that's this intersection level service criteria for rating intersections out there, um, A through F. The main thing I'll highlight on this slide is that the city has an adopted level service standard of D. So that would be 25 to 35 seconds uh, for people waiting on the side streets to enter uh, the roadway. And at a signalized intersection, level service D would be 35 to 55 seconds uh, for the average delay of vehicles traveling through an intersection. And here is existing intersection table uh, showing the study intersections on the left side, uh, the traffic control at each location. And right now, all the intersections are performing at uh, level service D or better uh, during the morning uh, and afternoon peak hour, which is shown there on the right and the left, there were two right side columns. Um, this new slide here shows uh, the 2040 intersection level service. So again, looking out uh, 23 years of land use growth uh, along the corridor in the city and even the regional. And uh, you can see that with the project improvements here, all the intersections would continue to operate at level service D or better, um, except at SR 900 intersection. Um, there's another city project that could address uh, the capacity needs at that location. So again, I'm just gonna quickly run through what we, we saw on Monday, but um, just talk about the benefits for each intersection as we go through it. So as Michael mentioned, the flying T through here, what we heard is from the residents at the first uh, workshop, is there's a lot of frustration getting out of this neighborhood, um, and the flying T helps clean that up. It helps you access safely onto 54th, or oh, sorry, excuse me, Newport Way. It also helps with the sight distance coming up, because around this corner, people are kind of coming around pretty quickly. It gives you a two-step maneuver, so it helps you get maneuver and merge into traffic in a safer fashion. 
in that example. So gateway housing, uh, we added a also another flying T3 here, also to help access their neighborhood and to leave their neighborhood. The raised intersection and pine code sets the tone for metering the first really, hey, you're coming through a neighborhood corridor area. Uh, it's basically gonna provide a left turn into the neighborhoods and then for future development, it also lines up that new development so it basically makes it a better alignment. And then we have the Pacific uh, Elm Gateway Apartments with Spyglass, the roundabout. And then we have the driveway at Sammamish Point. Uh, this is keeping it pretty much close to what it is today, except for we're removing the little island and allowing left turns in, and a, again, a, a flying T out. I'm gonna correct you, sorry. So the spyglass entrance um, will remain right in, right out only, as it is today. We do remove the, the island, but it's gonna be C-curbed. Um, and then it provides the flying T into Sammamish Point. Uh, the reason being that spyglass has their main entrance on the roundabout, mm -hmm. and this is really their secondary emergency access. And if we were to change the access at this inner, or at spyglass's driveway, it would affect our ability to provide a left turn at Smamish Point. Mm -hmm. yeah, can you show us where the secret would be on that figure? Um, it would be right on the yes. left-hand turn lane. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right. Oh, careful. C curve would be along here. Yes. So next we've added left turns, formal left turns into Riva and Summerhill, and these left turns will help residents enter into their neighborhood, and we've moved the crosswalk down to King County Trailhead and Riva. I'm gonna go back there a second. So. Um, yeah. So I, I, those flying T's are, are great, they do that. And, and then when you come to an intersection like this, you lose all that capacity, that ability. And so now <clears throat> um, you've got to cross basically three lanes of traffic to, to, to get out of your place with, um, with a left turn there, right? Which, which, so how does that compare when we're doing all this work on these other intersections and we're making it because we realize you can't get there and this is one intersection that seems to me that's lost capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like that delay could be pretty long at times, particularly as we go to 2040. Sure, so it, it hasn't lost capacity because right now they don't have left turn lanes. So we're providing, um, we're facilitating their ability to turn into their neighborhoods. Um, I think also what you're trying to point out though is that we are unable to give them a receiving lane to turn left out of their neighborhoods. Um, and so Michael's actually got some numbers on that that can help explain. Yeah. Um, let's see. So it's, it is gained capacity. Adding uh, the turn lanes into the site is, is definitely going to help folks out there get into the properties. Help um, them getting so, in. I'm worried about getting yeah, out. Yeah, so getting out. So the Flying T is a low-cost, you know, efficient way to help people get out. Again, it can only be used um, at a three-legged intersection. It's not that many of those places couldn't get out, it's just, this is better. Um, and we, we heard a lot of, we got quite a few emails during the week about this location and as well as we got um, some comments at the Monday meeting. So if I want maybe, if you're okay now, it's a good time, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail to try to address some of those comments and give you a little more um, background at this location. I'll start with more technical uh, data to give some background, then I'll get into a little more of what the, the impacts of that might be. Um, so Oakcrest on the south side of this drawing here uh, has 55 homes and the Riva development is planned on the north side and that's approximately 40 townhomes. Uh, neither of these locations has any through access to any other connection so it's kind of isolated for those uh, homes. Um, we've done, there's been a lot of activity in the corridor, so there's been traffic counts done at this intersection um, in 2015, 2016, and 2017. So we have some really good data uh, at this location. And it's all fairly consistent about the vehicles entering and exiting uh, the Oak Crest property. Uh, during the morning, peak hour, probably from 7.30 to 8.30, there's less than 15 cars uh, making that left turn out that you just described. Um, and during the afternoon peak hour, there's less than five cars uh, making that left turn. That's during conditions when it's the most, the most vehicles are on Newport Way corridor. Um, 
again, we looked at traffic going out 2040 years, or out to the year 2040, and that assumes the four main developments that are going on right now, Riva and Gateway. Um, we also includes, you know, background growth from other parts of the city or even nearby cities. Um, with those, all that background traffic, this intersection still operates at level service D uh, during the busiest time of the day, uh, during the morning peak hour and the afternoon peak hour. So we're showing that uh, it's meeting the city's level of service standard even 23 years uh, into the future. Um, and so we also got comments about additional traffic control at this location. Um, it, the side street volumes are approximately um, a fifth of what I would need to meet the criteria uh, to install an always stop. Um, there's uh, always stops are really intended to be, and this is an important takeaway, they're designed for an intersection where the traffic volumes are relatively balanced on each of the legs. Otherwise, what happens is um, one of the legs of the intersection, the two side streets will have low volumes and you'll have long queuing on the main line and the people will get up the side street and there may not be anybody even on the side street. Um, in this case, during the afternoon, there would be a car showing up to make a left turn about once every 20 minutes. And you know, we'd be stopping, um, you know, 10,000 people a day would be coming to a stop at this location um, throughout the day. Um, other thing that can happen with an always stop at this location is um, it's all, all about finding gaps in traffic is what the level of service is based on. And right now there's a traffic signal at 900 and that's putting people westbound into the corridor in a certain platooning fashion. Uh, by that I mean when the light goes green for one phase of the signal at 900, a group of cars will come into the corridor going westbound and then the traffic signal phase will turn off and the next phase will start. And in between that transition, you know, there'll be a space for a gap in cars. And what would happen with an always stop at this location is they'd all come up, they always stop and they kind of pile up behind it. And with no cars in the side streets, or minimum, not no cars, but uh, lower cars in the side streets, they'd basically be released um, from the intersection about every two or three seconds as they wait their turn. And that would create this effect of downstream from this location below westbound, could actually make it more difficult for other driveways to get in and out because we no longer have that platooning effect where you have a burst followed by um, a gap. Um, so that's one, that's kind of the potential downside of the always stop uh, is the low volumes on the side street. This location is not, uh, don't feel like it's a good fit. Um, and then there's also comments about a traffic signal. Um, this has even higher um, traffic volume threshold to make it a good fit to install a signal at a location like this. Um, so it's, the, we're farther away from something like that. And the downsides of a potential traffic signal here are we'd be at additional delay to the main street. And also, we would likely see an increase in rear end collisions as we're now stopping the flow of traffic on the main street. And not only just additional rear end collisions, but we could likely see an overall increase in collisions at the intersection by installing a stoplight at uh, this location. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then there's also the substantial cost of installing a traffic signal and maintaining it at the location as well. Um, so that's some more background and hopefully response to your question as well as some of the other ones we've been hearing. Right, and I wasn't trying to suggest any um, solution because I, I, I know all those have, have problems. I guess I'm just trying to look at the um, the concept and looking at the flow. Because if we have these other intersections needing where you can only cross one lane of traffic at a time and get your acceleration lane, and that's important, and I think those are great. And then this one gets going, the left turn lanes, to, it's, it makes it easier to get in, obviously, mm -hmm. but it makes it a lot more difficult to get out. Now I have to get across three lanes. Mm -hmm. and, and in that process, I could just see, I've done it before, other types of intersections like this. Where you, you, you got one opening, you got two, you never have the third. And then you got someone sitting in the left turn lane, so the person on the side street can never go because that person's holding that spot till they get the spot. And then when the next, before the next spot comes, the, the next left turner gets in there, right? 
And so I could just see uh, sitting there for quite a while in, in those situations when that happens, particularly when the left turners are coming in and you're trying to get out because that's that that's at that third lane and they're going to have the right of way. So I don't have a solution for this. I'm just wondering if it's the one intersection to me of all the other ones. They seem that they have quite a bit of improvement. This one. Improvement going in, but not coming out, just feels to me. And so I'm just, I'm just bringing that up. And, and I know you've been working at it, and you have, you know, answers for those things. But I don't have an answer either. But I'm just kind of, I would, I would feel a little frustration here. I think on, on how I'd be getting out compared to, you know, we're making it much easier for everybody else, right? So this is just my thought, Mary Lou. Thanks. So, um, Brian, and just looking at the configuration, so. To me, the, the design of it looked reasonable. I, I get the turning lanes and all the rest and everything that's happening. The level of service that's predicted to be there when this is built and through 2040 is level service D. So does that mean, if that's a 35 second delay or whatever it was, every movement could expect that? Or do some movements have three minute delays and others have sure. 10 second delays. Can you explain that? Because I'm just trying to figure out, just from the Oak Crest side of it, is there the possibility that they end up with a significant delay, but every other movement brings the average back up to a okay. D? Yeah, so um, for example, at a traffic, traffic signal, signal, we do the average, mm -hmm. the, or the, the average delay for every vehicle entering the intersection is measured. For this case, which we would consider a two-way stop control, where the main line does not stop, uh, the, it only records the delay for the side streets. So the through traffic is not recorded, and the through traffic would be less, obviously. I mean, the, the left turns in would be less. So this is, when you say level service D, that would be for the side streets. Okay, that's, that's great. So second piece of that question, so assuming this is the exact layout of the intersection and it gets built and reality happens that the Oak Crest Drive has a two minute delay. Mm -hmm. If this is exactly the configuration and there is now a two minute delay, what can you do? What can you do yeah. once it's built if reality is it's a two minute delay? So we, we deal with these issues all the time. I and you could, you, you could go out to <laughs> 900 and there's plenty of homes and groups of homes that enter onto there where the speeds are much higher and the yeah. volumes are much higher and it's a five lane plus facility. Um, so, you know, there's, there's challenges like this all the time and the solutions that we, we look at, you know, we we looked at a roundabout here. It's a tough, it's a tight fit. It would likely impact. Oh, I mean, assuming, I'm assuming oh, that yeah. is so, the okay. So this goes forward. Yeah, so you sorry. have Thank this, you for the we build this, and then there's a two minute delay out of Oak Crest. Sure. What do we do? We could reassess then with, I mean, we could, so options? even a roundabout could be back on the table. We could say, oh, you know, no, we didn't think we could fit it. Well, okay, so then that would come off the table. This is, this is what we've got, mm -hmm. but we predict it's a level of service T, and for whatever reason, it's not. It's two minutes, sure. but this is it. No rebuilding. Okay. Now what do you do? There's, so we could look at restricting right turns to be, or restricting left turns. We could maybe say the left turns out need to come down, and we could try to find maybe a U-turn location left for them. Left turn out of what? Not far, which left turns? Can't go right. Uh, so Oak Crest would only be able to go right. They could become could, a right in, right out. Well, no, we would probably keep the left in. Using take out the left turn lanes on Newport. No, we would maintain um, the left turns into the side streets. Yes. So those new left turn pockets, yes. that would only be going against one direction of traffic. We could probably look at keeping them, yeah. and possibly have the left turns out. Um, restrict those and possibly have those try to find a U-turn location down the corridor. Um, we could look at. You know, I mean, so you can consider everything they could try to look at again, maybe at seeing if a signal makes sense if the delays really are that long. Um, we would have all the, you know, we'd still have those problems we talked about. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to say, I think this works. I just want to understand what a tweak might be. Mm -hmm. And while what I call is a tweak, the neighborhood may not call a tweak. But if what it is is that Oak Crest then is a right into turn, right into town only, mm -hmm. because that crossing the three lane thing is not possible, I just want to get that out on the table. Mm -hmm. that that's where this might go. Because this intersection design looks appropriate if, in reality, you actually get a level of service okay. D. If you don't, I don't think we come back 
and look at a roundabout and a light and all the rest. That, that ship has sailed. Mm -hmm. This is it. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with this? And what you're saying is, at that point in time, out of Riva and out of Oakcrest, left turns may not be practical. That's okay. possible, yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to add um, one more component that, that makes thinking about this intersection hard is that what looks, what the experience out there today is, is so vastly different mm -hmm. from what the corridor experience will be out there after this project's complete. And so by by adding these um, these improvements with, with the new bike lanes, with the landscape medians, with the um, pedestrian facilities, in addition to our raised intersections and our, um, our roundabouts, that's going to change how this corridor feels. And um, even adding curb and gutter, which we don't have today, and the narrow lane widths, there's a lot of things out there that are gonna change how it feels to be a driver on this corridor. And so as a result, we expect driver behavior to be different. And that's one of the main goals of this project is to change that driver behavior. Um, so as Michael mentioned earlier, uh, we want to provide some traffic calming effects and at the same time, we want residents to be able to get home at, at night without being stuck on Newport Way for 30 minutes. So we are striking this balance, that balance of priorities of trying to slow cars down during the off-peak times where currently today they're driving over they may drive over the speed limit, but also be able to maintain some movement of, of cars at, at a reasonable rate in the evening hours. So that's that's the balance that we're we're striving to strike here. Thanks. Okay. So as we mentioned, we're doing another raised intersection at the Cougar Mountain Trailhead. Um, and you know, let me just iterate that at the close proximity to that uh, Summerhill Oakcrest Drive, um, it will have people slowing down through here to get over this uh, raised intersection. So they'll possibly be going 25 miles per hour. Um, so again, changing the corridor, changing the character and driver behavior. Uh, we have the Bergsma Homes, where we uh, Bergsma Homes access with the neighborhood access, where we are making it into a formal uh, formalizing the driveways on the north side and having a two-way left turn to help access both uh, Bergsma and the north side property owners. And then again, we have SR 900, where uh, we are uh, having an appropriate length left turn lane based on Michael's. Uh, uh, signal uh, analysis, and then adding the two-way left turn for people as they queue up. Um, and then we'll be looking at the design in further detail when we get to the more uh, fine-tuning things that pass the 10% design. Um, as we mentioned, we do have a grant funding opportunity that we um, believe we will be awarded in February for, for design funds. And then, um, we kind of went into some of the, the questions previously, but we wanted to take this time to, to talk a little bit about the questions that we received. Um, and again, we've we've received a lot of really good feedback, some of which you guys have been included on and some, some of which you guys haven't. And the, the public has posed some really good questions. And I, um, I do really appreciate the time and, and effort that, that they have taken to, to stay engaged and, and passionate about this, this corridor and help shape what we've come to. Um, and so I know that one major concern of the residents is, is having safety be a priority. And, and this is absolutely a common goal because this is our priority as well. You know, we are all looking to how can we make this, um, this corridor the best corridor that it can be. Um, for all of the users. And so uh, there's there's certainly things that have been raised that that are things to be addressed in this final design phase. Um, like I said, we've got about two years of design that we anticipate. So we are really just scratching the surface level um, with, with this concept. You know, this is really looking at the overall operational needs, but getting into driveway widths, you know, that is, we have a, a standard detail that we look at with that, but we also have um, turning templates that we look 
look at to make sure that that's operational, especially where we've got some curves. Um, looking at King County Metro bus stops as well as school bus stops, we've had initial meetings with, with both of those parties and have um, agreed that there's a lot of opportunity to, to continue to collaborate going forward as to you know where bus stops may be located and what, if anything, can be done to um, to facilitate those stops. And especially with our bike, our bike lanes, there is some opportunity there to, to potentially raise bike lanes or, or do other things that um, we can get into those details with design. Um, also looking at, at existing trees and which trees can we save on this, you know, currently it's a beautifully forested roadway. And so as we get into those types of, of details, uh, looking at elevations and walls and, and stuff, that's where we get into to those specific trees. And then um, site distance. I know that there's been a lot of concerns about, you know, being on a, a curved roadway with um, not being flat that, you know, can we achieve site distance? And, and there's a standard that we look at. So at every single entrance point onto Newport Way, there's a, um, a formula for looking at based on the, the speeds of the cars um, and how far out does someone need to be able to see to be able to pull out onto Newport Way. And so we analyze every single driveway, every single intersection for the for the site distance triangle, so to speak. And, and once we have that calculated, then that's also so when we take, start to take a look at, at future plantings and what may or may not be appropriate in some locations. Um, and then I know there's a question about street lighting. And, and certainly I know that out there today, there's, there's some lights on the trails. Those are, are shorter 12 foot high poles and um, only on one side of the street. And they don't uh, light the full roadway. And with the corridor project, we would come through and uh, meet our standards, which are, you know we have, we have code and standards that state the level of which we would light the, the entire roadway. And so there will be new street lights installed uh, along the entire corridor. Um, so those are, are, are some of the questions that we received from the public, and those are those are all things that we are going to continue to work on as we get into design. Um, there was also a question about um, removing our, our FPs from the, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons at the existing crosswalks. And um, and I know that's not the only time we've received that question. We weren't um, as clear in our last open house as to our intention there. And um, we have clarified it, I believe, in our, our design report. But we will be maintaining the, the RFBs at future crosswalks. And we are, in some locations, considering a potentially more robust signal, but that would be something that we have to look at, again, in final design. Um, being that those that would be a new technology for the city. So there's a lot of additional coordination to, to consider something like a hawk signal um, in the future. Um, and then also we had a, a great question about about the timing of the improvements and and I absolutely get there's a lot going on out there and um, with with the developers all coming in at their separate times with the King County Trailhead also coming in doing their project and then with ours as well and so um, you know we're trying to inform the residents as much as we can when we understand the developers construction timelines um, but as far as specifically the the crosswalk at Oak Crest um, you know that would be moved to the King County Trailhead as soon as we had pedestrian facilities on both sides um, and looking at prioritizing the King County Trailhead location because we've got the ability to provide a pedestrian refuge island there. So um, that could be a case where, you know, that would get moved with the our RFB mm -hmm. and potentially the pedestrian refuge island, but it could also be that the raised intersection aspect of that treatment would, would then come later with our corridor project. Um, and then with Michael having already gone into the traffic signals and four-way stops, I think we kind of, I think that's covering most of the questions and then I will be responding um, in writing to all these folks as, as well following tonight, so. Questions? Questions, Paul? 
I don't have any questions at this time. Uh, one of the things um, I haven't heard mm -hmm. recently that was really um, made loud and clear uh, previously uh, was um, was concern about uh, making left-hand turns. Uh, and you know, with, with you know, with the traffic coming up behind, and and um, I think that, and there was just there was always there was a lot of expressions of concern about my I'm concerned about getting rear end. It happened once at 54th, and those and. Um, I want to acknowledge that the, the, this concept, I think, addresses that very clearly by creating those left-hand turn lanes. I mean, that's very, very critical. Uh, and that just ha I haven't, haven't heard that reiterated and that specific mm -hmm. complaint and that issue which people experience and that, that this conceptual design does address that, which I think is important. Yeah, that is a good point. We, we did hear that. At, um, at open houses as well. So mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I've had the uh, opportunity to be exposed to this a number of times now. Uh, this is, I think, my third time. Uh, slightly, you know, you guys were here earlier, and then I got to see the layout and meet with you, Bran, and, and got to look at all this. And um, uh, I've done quite a bit of, of, of trying to observe and, and think about and, and do a little bit more reading about, about this whole concept of changing the feel of the corridor. Uh, and um, uh, the raised areas uh, along with the roundabout definitely changes things dramatically. Um, and uh, I'm, I guess I do have a question. It would be, you know, why just those two locations? Why not also, you know, the raised is, seems like that's pretty significant to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I, and, but I, I'm not studying that. It's just a gut feel. Mm -hmm. Uh, and did you consider that anywhere else to further kind of really try to shape that experience? Um, so, great that question. Direction? Yeah, and actually, um, Sheldon wrote me that question as well. Uh, <laughs> so we were looking at um, at those two intersections at a minimum, mm -hmm. um, and there are other intersections all throughout the corridor that we will continue to evaluate for that opportunity. Um, the unique part of the two intersections that we're considering um, is that they they have crosswalks on them, and um, there's not the, the flying T, that acceleration lane that we see in other locations. Um, so those are the kind of the two distinguishing factors as to the intersections that have been selected. Um, but we are going to continue to look into and and consider what that might look like if we did a raised intersection with a flying T, or if we did a raised intersection in a location without a crosswalk. Okay, so that, that thank you. That's a good point because I was. You said ten percent. Yes. This concept, conceptual design, represents like ten percent design. But and you've said at the intro here even that that the what you're looking for from council is is. Um, uh, a vote on, so to speak, the um, like the major elements here, the cross section and the intersections. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, um, I, I was partly under the impression that no other kind of significant changes were would um, you know go were possible. So a, a raised a raised intersection is still then on the table for other considerations. So a raised intersection um, to me is a part of like changing the character of the roadway, mm -hmm. and less about how the intersection functions exactly. and exactly. operates. Exactly. Exactly. So, I agree. So yes. Yeah, so we are looking at at buy-in from council for how the intersections I operate. See. Okay. Thank you. For that. Um, mm -hmm. But but certainly are going to continue to consider each character change mm -hmm. in how we can further. Um, provide traffic calming mm -hmm. in that method. Gotcha. Thank you. Mary Lou. Good question, Paul. Brianna, one thing I forgot, I did talk to Emily about, and I'm not sure if it got to you, um, <clears throat> just because there's a lot going on. I had asked for examples of what is it that will not change from this point on? What is it that could change from this point on? And so Paul just got one of those, that there could be additional traffic coming. 
So could you, um, I think it would be really helpful for council in getting all the way to uh, uh, concept approval, which I think is really close, is knowing what's locked in and what is something that could still be discussed in detailed design. Traffic calming was one. I'm thinking the little uh, ball belts that Oakcrest had concern about, that's another. Mm -hmm. uh, the landscape planning that Oakcrest had concerns about, that's another. But this is what's locked in in a concept. This is all still up for final design. Mm -hmm. Right. These, these things that are character changing, not um, intersection control. Right. That would be a good list to have, I think, because okay. that was a really, that was a great question. Yeah, and, and we can certainly add that into... Just a slide. Sure. In. And and to speak to that a little bit, it, the cross section would be locked in. So right. um, the, the elements that we see... It's a little bit why I wigged out when Michael said a lighter roundabout. I went, what? Right. No. Locked so, in, in. right. So, so the cross section would be locked in, and then the method of intersection control is locked in. So, so the roundabout at Gateway, the flying T operations of the intersections at 54th, and uh, the you know the two-way stop function of the intersection at Oakcrest, <clears throat> those types of things. So it's the operational function of the intersections combined with the cross-section that are locked in going forward. I think, I think it would be encouraging for council to understand even what Paul just brought yeah. up is that additional traffic coming is not off the table. Just sure. It doesn't show up here. It still could be on the table. Yes. Okay. And, and so just to add to what Brian just said, I think, I think it's really, Really straightforward, very simple about what what we're locking in, so to speak. Here is 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 really the those two, the two things that Brianne just mentioned: the cross section, which you see here, the uh, intersection control, which Michael's done a good job of going through. I think the other two um, important pieces are the access management. So, how where you're going to be able to access this corridor, where the driveways are, Locked those in. kinds of things. That's the what we've showed you here is what we're anticipating it's going to look like and barring any <laughs> changes to land use unforeseen that we're not aware of or something but this is what what we're going forward with and then I think also importantly is the horizontal alignment and the fact that we're generally building this corridor within along the existing horizontal alignment of the roadway and within the existing right-of-way those that that concept that we're building within the property nominally the property that we have is locked in. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, I think the, you know, pavement treatments and wall, what the walls look like and landscaping and, and uh, any number of other um, urban roadway design elements is the work from the 10% to the 100% Good to have a slide plans. for that. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of, um, in a really, really simple way, there's like, in, in my simple mind, there's three circles. There's this circle that's the 10% design, which is what we've shared with you here. There's the other circle, which is the 90, which is the remaining 90% of the design from 10 to 100. And then the third circle is the construction. So we have done a lot of work to get to this 10%. We still have some major components here, which is called ESME, final design, and then construction. So um, just want to reiterate that. I, I know that probably most everyone understands that here, but, but it does come up sometimes with the public as well, like we're going from this to construction, and I just want to reiterate, there's a few really important steps there and a lot of work to be done before we're building a roadway out here. So. So does that take care of our questions then for now? Yeah, All right, so time for audience comments. Anybody like to speak? And I think they took the microphone away from there, so why don't you... Speak loudly? <laughs> no, put, put that back there and you can grab one from over here. Put that you can put that up yeah. there. Good, good, put that back, yeah. And so Steve, why don't you grab that one? That, because that's an important. Oak rest, uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, good evening, I'm Hart Sugarman. A resident of the Issaquah for over 21 years, living at 2550 Northwest Oakcrest Drive. Um, when I look at 
the street, Newport Way, from State Road 900 to Lake Mont, is it serving the local community or is it really a pass-through roadway for people coming up um, State Road 900 and not wanting to drive to I-90 but actually turning on to Newport to just take the shortcut as a throughput roadway? So my vision was always to have stop signs at every single intersection as a way to prevent that kind of throughput traffic and really focus on the local community. Also, the street has a history. Many years ago, it was the highway before I-90. When I moved here 21 years ago, the speed limit was 50 miles an hour. It was a rural roadway. Then it dropped to 40 miles an hour. And now currently it's at 30 miles an hour. And I believe your plan is to even reduce it further to 25 in the, in the new design, or is it staying at 30? Stays at 30, okay. So the roadway's a minor arterial. But I think we need to look at how we can reclassify this roadway as a residential roadway. The number of dwellings that have been built over the years, if you start from the Lakemont side and, and working towards the east, we have Summer Hill, so, sorry, Sammamish Hills condominiums, Copper Leaf, Monahan, all built on Newport Way. We have the Sammamish Point built on Newport Way, and now Gateway and Gateway Senior. And then we have Riva. Riva's actually, the buildings are actually going to be built right on Newport Way, right? There's no front yards or backyards. These are homes going to be built like a zero lot line. So this entire street, the dynamics of the street has changed from rural to very, um, you know, urban, urbanized residential street. So I think we need to really tone down the street to make it slow pace, not a throughput road, but allowing the local people to get in and out of their neighborhoods. Now my concerns with this intersection, as I mentioned on Monday's meeting, is when I have to leave Summerhill community and turn left and stop at that white line, at the stop sign, my visibility to the west is very limited because of the curve of the road. If the roadway is widened, it sets me back even further. I can't see. I would then have to creep forward and forward to get that vantage point to see out, to turn left. Once the Riva starts construction, those people are want to get out at the same time. So we're, we're going to be conflicting as we egress each neighborhood for that single break in traffic. And as I mentioned on Monday, there are 20 intersections from Lakemont all the way to Front Street. 20 intersections, of which the ones that have four-way intersections have traffic lights. This is the first four-way intersection to be built on Newport Way within the city limits that will not have any traffic lights, which is fine, but I think we need to look at a four-way stop sign or an actuated traffic light that only actuates when a car triggers it to a red signal for the cross traffic. And that is done very successfully in, in Vancouver, Canada. Another thing is if you drive on Newport Way and you go west of Lakemont, the very first street west as you drive into Bellevue is a four-way stop sign at 164th. It's been there for years and it works successfully. So I think it can work at our intersection successfully. The time that we wait in the mornings to get out of our intersection has increased steadily. And it will continue to increase as the development takes its occupants with the, the people living in those areas. If what I hear tonight is one suggestion to just restrict it to right turn only exit from our neighborhood, I don't think our community will approve that and I, I can see that being a, a protest. Um, and in the morning, maybe what we need to have is, is a crossing guard. Just somebody coming out from the city, uh, you know, maybe it's not a police officer, but it could be a traffic enforcement person who just helps us get out. I mean, you look at downtown Seattle, all these office buildings have police escorts, you know, as people leave their 
underground parking garages, there's a police officer stopping the traffic flow on the street to allow the people to get out of the parking garages. Well, maybe we need help in the morning to have a crossing guard to help us leave our community. But I appreciate all the efforts in this. I think the design is great. Um, we have some elements to, to, to make the final details work. And the timeline for this to be accomplished, I know it's going to be in a, in a piecemeal process because it's only going to be uh, engaged as each development takes shape, right? Because Gateway will only build out at their area, and Riva builds out at their area, and Bersman builds out at their area. So it's going to be a, a very piecemeal process because of the funding that's available as well. But thank you very much for your, your input and, and your time. Thank you. Thank you, Hart. Hello, I'm Tina Conforti, and I live on 1220 Oakwood Place, Northwest Issaquah. Well, I saw a question before. Should the city council approve the, the concept recommending the design report? I would say no, you should not approve. Our residents cannot get out safe, and my priority, it is the safety. I was in the broadcast for 25 years, and that's all I promote. It was a safety for the public. And I think you, all of you, city council, you should be have the responsibility to give to us the safety. I never saw an intercession with a four, with a two, uh, with a crossway without a stop sign. There should be a stop sign, a four-way stop sign. We can never get out from my area. First of all, if you see the crosswalk here, where are we going to stop? Are we going to stop on the front of the stop board, of the, of the, of the crosswalk? No, we can't. We need to stop behind by law. We can't see once it's, uh, we are behind the crosswalk to make a left turn. That's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous and it's not, it, it requires a law that you stop behind a crosswalk before you make your left turn. We can't go over and cross another child and kill another child. This is unacceptable. It's, uh, I, I believe it. if you could show me a similar a road in Issaquah or in Bellevue without a have a four-way stop sign or a stoplight. It's unacceptable to haul the residents in our area. And then you talk about, you talk about, uh, Mike, I think he mentioned something about there are 10,000 people driving each way. That's on what time? At 2 o'clock in the afternoon and maybe 10 o'clock in the morning? That's not on the peak time. I believe it. Over 400 apartments and plus the, the townhouse and plus the senior homes been building. You can never make a number of a cars of the volume. You can't. They're not there. You come back at six o'clock in the night when we have a line all the way up by uh, 54 sometimes. So by putting stop a four-way stop sign, you reduce the risk of all of the accident over there. Because we can get out the safe and the other car, car they can move along when there is no car coming out. So I am sorry this is unacceptable on behalf of the whole our community. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. My name is Mary Lynch, and I would like to talk a little bit about the process and go back a little bit. Um, first of all, there were some comments made during the earlier agenda bill about how they've been working with city staff for over a year, year and a half. And that's what we found has happened with this. Um, Mountains to Sound Greenway by city staff was put on the north side of this road without any input from the public. 
those of us that live out there now currently have no parks and no sidewalks on which we can ride our bikes or our children can play. Yet you want to put the Mountains of Sound Greenway on the north side of a major or a, a minor arterial without adequate safe crossings. And you want to move, and I think it's right from a safety standpoint of view, Oak Crest Crosswalk away from the curve. But that means we're going to have to walk down to the trailhead with our little kids and our bikes to cross at the trailhead with possibly a beacon, um, but not a hawk. And our behavior I see around Issaquah is Drivers do not stop for the yellow. They do not honor the crosswalks and people in the crosswalks. So you can say you're going to change behavior, but until Issaquah takes a much more forceful way of educating drivers, you need hawk systems to make people stop, because most people, 85%, will stop for a red. Now, there's still those that run through it. We know that, too. But anyway, we were never asked where the Mountains of Sound Greenway went, and I still think it should be on the south side. And if you accept this concept as it is, that means it will always be on the north side. And when you get out to the other end, why would you put a Mountains of Sound Greenway on the north side past South 54th? There's nobody that lives there. And your experience is you're putting people up against the freeway. So I would like you to look at where the Mountains of Sound Greenway is going to be put for the, for the total corridor. That going back, River. when we first started looking, we were involved early on in the process with the other com uh, communities who were going to go where River was, it was always going to be a staggered intersection. It was never going to be at Oak Crest. When and who decided without public input, because when it came to the Development Commission, we were told this is the way it is. When we gave our concerns and inputs, we were told this is the way it is. We as citizens had no input at the Development Commissions, and that's why we attended and we spoke up about needing the moratorium, is there were things in the um, central area plan that allowed things to get way beyond and etched in stone, so when we got into public review, we were told, it's it, you have no input. So I want to say, why can't we go back to RIVA and look at redesigning this? If we already know it's designed wrong, everybody else is getting a flying T intersection. Why can't we have our flying T intersection? Why can't RIVA have a flying T intersection? That would be the easiest way to get this resolved and maybe help let us get to work. The other thing is drive up your economic development in Issaquah so that those, the majority of the 55 homeowners, and most of those have three and four people working in their homes. Most of them work in Seattle and come out of our development in the morning and turn left in Seattle. I'm one of the few currently, and that's because of the downturn, that's working in, or working in Issaquah and turn right. Most of the people turn left out of there in the morning. And it is almost impossible because when you're coming from S900, they're flying. And they will still fly over the raised embankments because I've been up in uh, other other places where they, they people still do that if they know it's there. But look at the process that was used. And I want to say that coming with this concept drawing and starting last summer, it was refreshing that I think the KPG actually listened to us and felt like our voices were being heard. But we didn't at the development commissions. But I'd also say going forward this type of process, we had to intend to get you know, our voices heard four to five meetings during the summer all at once, or we weren't going to be heard. And you have stretched our neighborhoods to the limits, and it's not appreciated. So I would say review the process. Going forward, use this, but stretch it out between community meetings. Make sure that you hear what we're saying. And going forward with construction, I still have not seen the best practices for construction. And since this is going to be piecemealed, how are we going to get to and from our homes? How are we going to walk along here? And we need to see best practices for construction and how we're protected. I did like, I would have liked to see a sidewalk built over on 7th Avenue with the Locus uh, project, but at least they have the orange barriers creating a pathway and some sort of protection from, that's 25 miles an hour and they have it. 
we had plastic cones for the anti-aircraft creek out there, protection from them. And I will say, Tony tried to get the speed limit down to 25. We had very little police presence out there, so during construction, it was more than 25. The other thing I would like to, to say is, because of the amount of time we spent this summer, the other thing we got, oh, I know, the, the roundabout, that also was forced on us. We had no say-so on what was happening. And development staff worked with the developers to decide where that was gonna go. And it wasn't until this meeting and KPG coming in, beginning to hear our voices, where we're able to get the roundabout moved back onto the Wolf property without really, I mean, they're, they're still gonna have to give up property with the Sammamish Point, or with the Spyglass. But the original roundabout was gonna take their entrance at, and also close off the west entrance of, of Sammamish Point. So the other good thing is they listened to us, they went back and have come up with, I still don't think it's a real good roundabout because there's not long enough lead-ins to slow traffic down, but it's probably the best solution we're gonna get and it is back on Wolf property where it should have been to begin with. So I would like to see in the accounting of this project that monies and their time be charged to the developer, as is whatever we're gonna do with Rivet, to the developer and not to the public. Because this should have been done early on, if it had been done right, the developer would have paid for it and not the, the, the uh, uh, staff and we already heard last year that the city staff had spent about $150,000 of engineering for that roundabout last year. This was before they were even brought in. So they did listen. I do think they were heard and people appreciated that. The other thing that's not been brought up is the concurrency for this corridor from S900 to Lakemont is based upon a three lane road the entire length. That's what your concurrency model is based on. So all the concurrency that's done with Gateway and River is based on a flawed report because we aren't going to get a three lane road the entire length. And I still, and they really didn't look at the interim intersections and I know they've done some with levels of service, but I don't think you know the true traffic that's going to be impacting Issaquah in 40 years, let alone in the next 10. Um, so going forward, I would hope that some of these things we continue to be involved with and we can come back and give our voice before it's etched in stone. And I would like to definitely see best practices and the, uh, the, the existing community put first, first, and I would like to see the Mountains to Sound Greenway location revisited to consider on the south side for those of us who have no parks, who have no flat grounds, and that was not part of our original development. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm assuming that's all. <laughs> all right. So. Time for discussion. Sure. Mary Lou, you look like you were voice anxious. left. Yeah, scratch um, it out. <laughs> for, so just for the discussion of the corridor concept, I am ready to move ahead with what we have now, which is the 10% version of the drawing. <coughs> but I did want to address some of the public comments that we heard as well. Um, I do think we need that increased focus on, um, I think Brianne mentioned a hawk signal or potentially a new kind of signal that we don't use. If we're truly going to move to an urban area that promotes pedestrian crossings, I think we need to go that way. And so I was glad to hear that you mentioned that. As far as field fits go, I think that the community expressed some concerns with driveway widths. Um, road entry into existing suburban style subdivisions and trees and also the ability to have clear sight lines. So I know that's something we can do as we get further along in design. I think it's important. I'm excited about the King County Trailhead and Pedestrian Refuge. I'd like to see Pedestrian Refuge included in as many corridor designs that we do. I think that is an excellent concept. I would have loved to have seen even maybe a little bit more in this one. Um, if I just go to the process that you ran, Brianne, this summer, I have to say it's one of the best processes I've seen in a long time. I think for a neighborhood that feels under siege, as you can hear this neighborhood feels like, 
Well, you did an amazing job. There's a lot of emotion about actually things that have happened in the five to 10 years leading up to this. So good job on your process. I think it was good. But I agree tonight that there were a lot of decisions made in isolation, one parcel at a time, and then we jumped in and we did a corridor study. I feel this, I'm glad the city's got the Gilman study coming next and hopefully the next piece of Newport after that, but our city should have had these corridor studies done before the decisions got made for us, parcel by parcel by parcel. We are behind. And that's not a criticism, that's just a fact, we're behind. And if previous councils didn't provide the money, bad on us. But we are behind and that has caused a lot of pain, especially in a neighborhood that gets four major development projects, anti-aircraft creek, and their entire street redone in a period of five to six years. That's, there is no doubt that their pain is real, that their, what it makes them anxious and upset is real. So we have to take a hit for that. We have to understand that this is why they're here still tonight saying this didn't work for us. That makes sense to me. Um, we need a plan for making sure, or we need to assure the existing residents that as this plan moves forward and we move into developers constructing some pieces and the city coming back and do the others, that we want their neighborhoods to function well, efficiently, safely, all the rest of it. I asked about the, what could we do with this configuration in this corridor at that location for a specific reason. We're gonna build it that way for sure. So I, what I heard is that if it's not working, there may be a proposal to restrict turns, but I also heard that maybe there's an option for some other configure, um, other control that could be used to trigger um, a stop at some times. I don't know what's available or what's possible, but we need to make sure this neighborhood, when this is all done, feels like they are have access and they're safe with that access. So um, don't know what that looks like, except that we do know what the intersection configuration looks like, because that's locked in. That's what we, when we say yes, that's what we get. But if, if we come to it and find out that they are waiting six and seven minutes because they can't do something, I'm committed to saying then we need to help them because that wouldn't be okay. That wouldn't be level of service D. And we're telling them they're getting level of service D. We need to make sure they get level of service D no matter what. Um, I think what made this so challenging is that and going back again, we can't revisit this decision, but there's a piece of land on one side of the road that's designated urban and a piece of land on the other side that's suburban. And we are going with an urban standard, which I think will be good for the existing neighborhood as well. But it's awkward to, when you do that. So that made that particularly challenging and I think you've done a good job with your design. My opinion is we should lock in what we have and move ahead. Um, so that's, that's where I had us move ahead. Oh. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, engineers, uh, I, I gotta start out by saying one thing. You, all, you three are all engineers, right? But it took this engineer to talk before I heard the phrase horizontal alignment. <laughs> <laughs> so good job. <laughs> you got you guys talking to the public, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and uh, balance, uh, competing requirements, competing needs. Um, I think that's a difficult um, mix to work within um, and with a lot of emotion as well. And um, I do appreciate, and, I, and I, I've sensed from all of your work, a real sensitivity to um, uh, not only the residents, uh, but um, kind of your own profession and sticking with what I know um, you've been trained and have lots of uh, experience and, and how to do this and do these in the best way possible. That, I've felt that quite a bit, that you constantly were striving for um, you know, like doing the right thing. And it can be really difficult because you can't satisfy everybody. Um, um, I, I, as I said earlier, um, um, I do accept that this 
as proposed, will change the feel and the nature of, the, of what happens as a motorized user. I use this roadway all the time. Uh, both motorized and, and non-motorized. Uh, so it's, it's not just up to my imagination. Uh, I do use, I do see what the speed limits are, both in front of me and my own when I go through that reader board. So I have a really good idea of, of kind of what it is like to be a user of the corridor. There's no doubt in my mind that what we're gonna do here is gonna change. But I'm gonna echo, I agree with um, Mary Lou on a couple really key points uh, that, and there's some of these design details that'll come later, like what is it, the actual control Control for pedestrian control later on down at the at the um, that you still have to do. I think that's that's an excellent one. Um, I, very interesting um, um, comment this evening about the about the mountains of sound greenway. And I wanted to ask you one question. It seems like I've heard somewhere in this dialogue about the green the mountains of sound greenway as an organization. Actually, do they have any comment or input on this? at all. So I'm going to stop right there and let you answer that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, I did meet with the Mount Sound Greenway Trust um, and had a few conversations with them. And I also met with the city of Bellevue. Um, the reason being that the Mount Sound Greenway is a regional trail that extends from Issaquah and someday all the way into Seattle. Um, the city of Bellevue is currently designing their Mount Sound Greenway gaps. Um, and so the city of Bellevue has the Mount Mountains to Sound Greenway on the north side of their corridor, uh, which is where it would meet up at Lake Mont. And um, one thing that Mountains to Sound Greenway stressed as something that we, as their priority, is, is consistency. Um, a regional trail user shouldn't be able to feel the difference between City of Bellevue and City of Issaquah. A regional trail user um, should have a consistent experience throughout. Um, and so that was one one key that was important important to them. They are um, quite happy with the corridor project as a whole. Um, they're very excited to see this gap filled and they see the, the improvements with both the multi-use trail and the bike lanes as, as providing some real asset to the regional corridor. Um, so that's, that's kind of where they weighed in on. Okay. So, all right. So, okay. So, you did have some interaction with them. Yeah. Uh, you know, thank you very much. So, as a, as a concept design uh, with the elements, including, oh, where did it go? Including the horizontal alignment, but the intersection controls as proposed, the the cross sections as proposed, and the access management. Um, uh, and um, the right of way. Um, yeah, I'm I'm in support of this going forward with with the additional comments that we've we've already shared. Right. Um, I agree with a lot of what's said also. Um, I think, but I disagree with some of uh, things. I have some other ideas. So definitely what Mary Lou said on, on the neighborhood and, and what this has happened over the last, you know, 10 years in particular um, has been tough and uh, definitely want to make sure we take fix that as best we can. I think the process has helped. I think they are finally being heard to some to to a better extent than before. Um, so that that's important. Um, so that's been a good change. Uh, and and, and their safety in using that. They, they are on a long, thin corridor with nothing but a long, thin corridor. Most of our other neighborhoods are, are shorter. You get out of them, you hit something. This is a long, thin corridor that you're kind of stuck on. There's no way on or off that except at the two ends. Uh, so it does create something very different. Um, so slowing people down is, is, is a tough thing because I, I have other places and as soon as you go through that roundabout, boy, you're back up to speed because our cars are quick nowadays. They're not all cars. They, they're right back up to 40 miles an hour in about three seconds. So it's, it's, easy to, it's not easy to slow them down um, on a long, thin corridor. I, I have, my biggest concern is um, that, well, I'm back a little bit. I brought it up already on the one intersection. I think we, so a lot of these intersections have done some good things. I do have concerns on, on a couple of them that, that aren't quite there yet for me. And I understand when you look at the numbers and this and that and whatever, that you know, other, other normal 
standard features you go to don't really work because I, I think a four-way stop there with you know uh, you know all through the day for for a short period of time when it's really critical is 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 a tough thing to, to do so I understand that very clearly um, but I'm not gonna say I don't have an answer but I still feel that if I was in that neighborhood I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be very comfortable with with this happening there's some something else got has to occur in those places that were blocking people in and I don't know the history uh, someone mentioned that the Reva's turned it into a, a, a you know a four leg on I don't know the history on that with you know, planning and development and so forth and how it got there you know with what Reva's done I haven't paid attention to uh, but somehow we got it to where it is and, and maybe we can look at that and, and see but that that intersection and a little the other ones do bother me on on neighborhood access um, or ingress and egress. The left turn lanes make it great, but if I can't, I can only get in, I can't get out, it doesn't do me much good. And I assume when Reva build, builds out, they'd have the exact same feeling. They're just not there yet, right? Um, and I want to talk about bike lanes a little bit. Um, as you, you already know. Uh, this is Mountains of Sound Regional Trail. Uh, I've talked a bunch with them, and uh, they're, they're not, a, you know, they, they have a lot of uh, support for getting this gap filled, but they're not jumping up and down saying this is exactly the way we want it either, I don't believe. Um, and I've talked to them about bicycle protection and so forth. We're talking about Vision Zero is, you know, the new mode, and our city hasn't adopted Vision Zero, I know that, but we try to use a few pieces of it here and there where we can, and, we, and uh, it's definitely a new thing on how to protect bikes, uh, bicyclists, and, and how to protect the people from bicyclists because um, people are, are uh, threatened by bicyclists going fast as bicyclists are threatened by cars going fast, right? So they're kind of in that middle ground. I think it's a perfect opportunity to create the protected bicycle lane as a major piece on here. And I think we're missing that opportunity. I think the, the bicycle groups, the, the ones that really um, do travel the corridor as, as their freeway, right? Because they don't have the freeway. So this is their freeway. And, and, they're, and they're, they're smoking, you know? Any of those downhill runs, they're going because they're usually trying to get somewhere. They're not sightseeing. So I think we need to give them protection. Uh, we, and we have not taken that into consideration. They did not come to our meetings. I know they were invited and they didn't come. And so we didn't get, we missed a voice there. We got the neighborhood voice, uh, but we didn't get the, those, those pass-through bicyclist vo voice, I don't believe. So I, with, with a few of those concerns, and particularly with not having protected bike lanes, I, I can't support this as a concept to go forward um, at this point in time. I'd, I'd have to really look back and uh, have someone prove to me why we couldn't do that. And I know there are some things of, of uh, you know, concerns of fitting things in in the total road width. This is not just, oh, let's just put them in. We have lots of room. I know it's not an easy thing done. I know emergency vehicles have, have some concern, uh, but I still think it can be done because this, as people said, this isn't a th three-lane road. The design is a two-lane road, and it happens to widen in a few spots where we make some left some turn lanes. But basically, other than those places, we don't have a median. We don't have uh, uh, that three-lane road width that is taking all that width up. So I think it is there, uh, and it can be done. I think we need to be a little more creative and step up and try to think a little more into the future uh, than historically what's been done. This is a fast, uh, you know, even 30 miles an hour with, with cars. It's not a, it's not a uh, you know, residential street at 25. It is higher speed than that. Then I think we need protected bike lanes. So I won't support this going forward at this point in time without that and a few of the other concerns on, on some of the intersections because um, those are done deals. That, that's a done deal. Those aren't going to be, you know, additional traffic coming that you can just slow that down with. So um, that's, that's my vote. So it's gonna be a, a two to one going forward uh, to council next uh, December 4th, right? So we will, we will send it to council with a two to one um, going forward. Um, but I think, we, I think we need a little more work. This is, what gets built here is a 50 year live with or longer. And no one can make me say that we have to speed up the process now because of one little thing and not get it right because we're gonna live with it for 50 years. I don't care, I mean, we need to get it right. We're gonna live with it. So if we need to back up a little bit and it takes a little bit longer, that's, that's, that's just fine with me. Because that's, 
that's what we got to do. It's it's a long. It's going to be there, and it's going to you know all these folks and maybe their grandkids who will be living in their house will be living with this for a long time. So I, I think we need to take another look and uh, get that voice heard. And I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to to uh, try to get a hold of some bike groups, and uh, and I'll continue my conversations about the Sound Greenway. Um, and I don't think they've been asked the question about the north and south part. I know they want some consistency and it's on the north side in Bellevue, but just because Bellevue does something one way doesn't mean we have to do it exactly the same way. That's that Changing the side of the road does not change the uh, the trail. That's not something that does. It's other things that change the character of the trail. So I don't know, but I think just because Bellevue's done something first in a piece, that mean, doesn't mean that's the standard. Because this trail doesn't just go here to Isqua, it goes all the way to Snoqualmie Pass and beyond to the east side. This is a long piece of trail. Um, so then this is just a piece of, but it, it is our trail through Issaquah. It. it is our main east-west route. If you're not on the freeway, this is where you are. So I think we need to get it right. So that's where I am. I'll pass that on when we take it to council on the fourth. Okay. You have something, Shelby? Just a clarification. So I'm hearing two to one to approve. The question is, I presume regular business. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> just want to just want to clarify. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, in this, so in this case, regular business doesn't even need to be questioned. That's what I was but. expecting, <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure that that's yeah, what the intent is. Since we already had one is. touch with council, and, and yes. uh, yeah. So regular business, and I'll and I'll talk. I'll address that. Can too, I also, and So can the other council members when we bring it up. Can I also ask um, what level of presentation you guys would expect at the next council meeting? Um, Chime in, but I'd say I, any of the questions that, that folks have a little bit, I think we need to address a little more. Um, this, the presentation you have here, it was seen at work session, so I'm not sure how much you want to. Yeah, my my that. thought is you probably did not have to do the whole presentation again this evening, but the answers you did to the questions was good. If you can add a slide that says what's locked in, what, that'd be good for me. So I would think a shorter presentation. Yeah, because we've seen it once already. And then give Bill time to, to talk. Yeah, because I'll, I'll have to do the minority talk. opinion. Because he's going to talk. <laughs> um, so, are we clear on... on well, I, do, I do like, I, I think it's okay to, re, personally, I think it would be okay to repeat what you did just when you guys did the back and forth and you talked about the different elements as you went, as you stepped down the corridor and you talked about that. I think that's okay. This is going to be, this will be the first time for some people to hear that. At the very beginning, you actually did kind of list some of the things that are still going to be finalized in design. And, I, and, and so I know it was already kind of part of what you were thinking, so I do agree with what we've kind of said already to kind of make those things very clear. But I, but as far as as far as what we do at the regular business meeting, I, I, I think it's very valuable to hear the description and of of the design elements. So, so we'll. Um, I think that's clear direction. I think we'll take we'll take what we showed shared with you tonight. We'll. Um, Maybe add a little bit about what's locked in and reinforce some some of the question discussion. Maybe tighten up the the, the presentation that we gave. Them. Take out a little bit and just sort of the meat of it, and come back to full council on the fourth with that. It shouldn't be more than you know 10, 10 minutes or so of our time, and then the less the rest would be for council questions and discussions. That sound yeah. And and the one thing I think would, would help in it in its yeah. here too. Um, it sure helped me, and I don't know how we can do that in front of council, but. We're seeing just pieces, and and somehow when you okay. see the, the the whole, it makes a lot more sense. And I don't know how we can do that because you have a wonderful map, but you, you can't do that very well in in, in uh, with council there. But it sure can can see that because otherwise, you know, somehow it gives some uh, some distances between this intersection yeah. and that one or something. You yeah, know, it's like can, okay, this is a quarter mile, this is a half mile, this is sure. three hundred feet, right? Sure, we um, can we can do something like something like that. that to give a better feel for overall from end to end. Yeah. And then, and I'd like to also this is, you know, what we're really talking to one piece, but what's the rest of the piece to our boundary, right? 
that they're not doing. So then we have another X mile of road to, to Lake Mont, right? One more okay. question, actually. Um, Kurt, I would appreciate it if there was also a slide. <clears throat> and these folks have come to meetings for months, if not almost a year on the project. I think we should capture their concerns and say that there is some, cons there's a lot of good feeling in the community about the project, but this does not get us to 100% satisfaction with everybody. I just want to point out that these things are still being asked for because I'd like to acknowledge the fact that they have some valid concerns. And so if that is in there, I think that would be good. Sure. No Thanks. Problem. Yeah. Just in case they don't want to come to their 19th sure. meeting on it. <laughs> And then I have one more point of, of clarification that I was going to try and do earlier, but I, I missed it. So um, there was a brief conversation about the cost estimate on Monday night, and um, I we were not in, entirely accurate. So um, the traffic task force uh, original number that you guys saw for the project was $7 million. And that included um, all of the developments doing their frontage improvements. We, at that time, had an independent cost estimate done, and the independent cost estimate came in at $22 million. And so, at that time, you may have remembered that we talked about how we had this collective group of projects, and the collective total um, at that time um, matched between the independent cost estimate and the original estimate that was floating around. It was just that some projects projected higher costs and some projects projected lower costs. And so it ended up balancing where we could say that, no, the total for the potential traffic bond at that time was still an accurate total. Um, I wanted to explain a little bit where we're at now. So for design, right of way, and construction, we're up to um, 38.7 million, or no, yeah. And um, the p key differences are that um, this cost estimate does not assume that Bergsma will be building anything. You know, there was the Bergsma development agreement, which would have built um, the full roadway improvements. Yep. And um, now, at this point, we have we've not even assumed that. Bergsma will build half because of the, the phase that they're in and they're permitting. They're at that earlier phase. We're not sure. It's not a guarantee that they're going to come in and build for sure. Um, the other thing that the uh, other cost estimates never considered was the culvert crossings and, and upgrading them for fish, fish passage, which was a newer regulation that came down. And so there's significant cost, um, just as Anti-Aircraft Creek was done this summer. Um, there's five other creeks in the stretch so there's that to that has been added as a part of this quarter project based on those those requirements and then the other thing of course is is projecting out into the future so you know knowing that we're not building this today that you know we're likely building this at best three years from today and there's been extraordinary um, inflation in both construction costs and property values and so in the areas knowing that we do have areas of, of purchasing some property, um, we have escalated that accordingly. And of course, that was much different even back in 2016 when the original cost estimates were done. Um, and, and then also the, with the construction cost going up significantly in this last year. So I wanted to, to kind of um, correct myself and provide a little bit of additional background there. So question, when you that 38.7 million, that'd be our cost for that, but that t does take into account the the known parts that developers are going to put in, right? The roundabout and that's assuming and that assuming. Gateway builds the roundabout, and that assumes that Gateway builds in front of the senior housing their half street improvements, not the full street. It's not in the 38 million. That's yeah. not included. So the known developer, the known developer yeah. stuff is out of that 38 is not included. So that's it would be additional stuff we won't be spending, right? Because they'll, they'll do it. Okay. Correct. Thank you. And not the unknown developer. Correct. So. Great. Anything else? Are we good on this one? Okay. So, um, with that in mind, we have actually uh, two things left because we have project updates. 
And then we're, I'm going to add another one on here for a slight discussion of process okay. um, with Transportation Benefit <laughs> District. Okay. So uh, let's do project update first, and then we'll add a little discussion on Transportation Benefit District um, process, not details. Okay, so everybody's got their list. Sheldon, what do you like to highlight for us? Is it possible, Sheldon, to put it up on the big one too? Yeah. Thanks. Aim for Sheldon. No, no, I just didn't know if you were saying something. So I guess one that I'd like to highlight is further down on this. Uh, it not show up on the whole screen. It, it's... That one? It. There you go. Thank you. So the, uh, I guess the one project that I'd highlight is the larger project that, you, that is going on right now in the city, and that's the Southeast 62nd Street Extension Project. Uh, Piling is all in for the foundation of the bridge. Uh, the fill material is completely placed over on the east roundabout and for the uh, trail separated grade crossing and so we're monitoring for settlement so that the pre-consolidation happens. Uh, they're actually, uh, the contractor has been working for the past week to two weeks. Uh, putting in about a pile cap every few days or so. So they only have probably about four pile caps left to put in. That means rebar and concrete pour. And then once that's done, then they're looking at January for the first girders to be coming in, the new bridge. Uh, Right now, it's anticipated in the schedule that the primary consolidation settlement associated with the fill material on the east side is expected to be completed towards the end of January. So uh, that's what's tentatively on the calendar. And then, of course, after that, there's all sorts of other work that's going to start to occur in that area. So that sounds like it's moving along. Is that on schedule? Is it's it it's moving along well. We've had some delays, uh, utility conflicts, uh, delays on the utility companies getting out there doing some stuff, and then we've had some uh, slowdowns just due to logistics of traffic control and other items over in the Lake Drive area. It's. Pretty close to on schedule. We're still looking at trying to get the road open towards the end of next year. Okay, great. Uh, else you'd like to highlight? Nothing else to really highlight. If you guys have questions about anything, I'm happy to uh, respond to them. Okay. Uh, well, I see we're, we're working on the flashing beacons in front of City Hall here. Yes, we are. Yep, so they're going in. They're we going got another on. one in earlier over on um, 2nd, right? 2nd. We also did Front South uh, at the 600 block. Right. And then we're also working in the area of Juniper and 7th. Okay. Sheldon, there was talk about two works, uh, <clears throat> two studies that were done this year. I think one was, I guess getting worse. One was the roundabout at Southeast 43rd and a possible reworking of that, and I don't know what, are those two studies on here somewhere? Uh, you have the Costco access study, the okay. 10th Avenue, that crossing study, yes. We're still in the, under review. The other one was the study about the Southeast 43rd roundabout, yeah. and uh, it it did recommend that we could close the, uh, 
the bypass lane, yeah. but we need to take that information and now incorporate it into the update of the capital improvement program and TIP. So I think I sent you an email, but I might not have. Did I send you an email? That's no, you me. did. I just haven't had opportunity oh, to okay. respond to it, but go ahead, ask no, the question. Not, I might have copied Bill. Copy yeah. on? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. the question is, there was a development on E6 Mammoth that was built before the roundabout. Yes. And then the roundabout was built, and then that development has subsequently discussed a lot of issues they have. And is it possible to combine looking at access for them in conjunction with the slip lane so that whatever we do might improve their situation as well? Yes. Now, for, as far as the access, uh, one of your questions also uh, was contemplating the possibility of having full access restored uh, that's to it. Not and that's, yeah, not probable. Uh, the Development Commission and the conditions in development actually recognized the proximity of that driveway to the intersection of 43rd and East Lake Sand Parkway, and specifically called out that if the if necessary in the future, that yeah, that would be restricted to a right in, right out. That and, would be great and, to get and, so, that piece in writing, and right. then the second piece. And then the other is, is we will, as we develop the CIP in a conceptual fashion, look at what we can do to improve their access okay, uh, to the best that we can. Yeah. Uh, and we're gonna actually, I was talking with Brianne about that the other day as she'll probably be the one developing the CIP concept uh, and trying to creatively think of a way to where we can improve their entry and exit. Even uh, if it means um, just giving them like a way to move out of traffic uh, yeah, and enter. I've done it a yeah. couple times myself. It is scary as all that. To yeah, come out and try and turn it yeah Brian and I actually had a conversation with a grease board the other day talking about it. So, okay, awesome. yes, no, it was email well written, well spent time. I will just wait yeah. for when you have some time to yeah, answer. So. Yeah, I do. The East Sunset Way neighborhoods um, traffic calming? Yes. Is there anything happening there? I will let Mr. Seaman speak to that. Thank you. There is, there's, um, yes, there's quite a bit happening on that. Um, so as you recall, late this summer, we had a, a workshop open house at mm -hmm, the Senior mm -hmm, Center and mm -hmm. got a lot of great input from a, a number of people. And uh, we took all that, all that information, all those comments back, and uh, along with the information that we've collected with speeds and traffic volumes, came up with a, a plan or traffic for installing preliminary um, pilot traffic calming devices in the East Sunset neighborhood, both north and south of um, Sunset. Of East Sunset, thank you. And so we're in the process of um, finalizing that design. Um, our, our plan is to get that information out to the neighborhood here in the shortly, very shortly. Hopefully within the, within the next month, we're sort of bumping against the holidays here, but that's still the plan is to get, get that information out to the community in calendar year 2017 and hopefully uh, install those interim traffic calming devices either by the end of this year or sh or shortly into the into January of next year. So, and those interim traffic calming devices, just a spoiler alert, I guess, is uh, so you all know, is um, are primarily speed humps and um, small traffic circles, similar to what you'd see in um, Seattle. So, and they're interim in that we're looking to, um, they're not permanent devices. They're um, probably going to be rubberized curb with with um, some kind of fill in the middle, asphalt or something for the traffic circles, and then temporary speed humps that are um, drilled into the pavement, but can also be removed. And so, and they're in locations that that we took all. As I said, we took all the information that we got from the community. We um, took that along with the, the speed and the data that we had, and located these where we felt they would most, where they would best address people's concerns and comments. And so that's. <coughs> Excuse me. That's phase phase one of this work. Um, our, our idea is to get those devices out there, get them in place, let people live with them, uh, see how they work, 
um, have them out there for we're thinking about maybe a 10 to 12 week um, period. And over that time, uh, get people's comments on an ongoing basis and see see where we're at. And so, and if they make, I think then the next step after that is to uh, decide, um, yes, those make sense to be a permanent installation or some of them aren't quite right or some of them maybe are in the wrong location, but that's the purpose of the pilot program and we're, you know, we're excited. We haven't done anything like this before. I certainly haven't done anything um, in a pilot sense like this before, so it's, it's, I think it's new to all of us. I think it's exciting because um, rather than talking about it, sort of the standard way of doing traffic homing is getting 70% or 60% or some percent of votes and that's always hard to do and you end up not doing anything so we're trying a, a different approach which is let's just go out and do something in a preliminary pilot way get impact for, or I'm sorry input from the public about how it's working and then decide what the next steps are from there so that's that's uh, I know I haven't given you specific dates but we're currently in the process of um, working with a contractor to figure out um, costs and, and available ability to do that and then the other piece that we want to do is get that information about exactly where those devices are going to be placed and share that with the, the uh, East Sunset community. All right, thank you for all that detail. When's the last time you had contact with the community? So any messages going out and and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if so it isn't time or uh, that to at least make a status update Available. That's, I, it, that's it, fair. I have, that's, the, I have the impression that it's been a while. So Has the, anybody's the, heard from us. The last really big input that we've, where we've shared with the community, was that was that um, late summer yeah. meeting. So I, yeah, some type. And I don't know if you have a contact list or how you're doing it right now, but I think some kind of a status update. Sure. Fair enough. Um, just to let people know that they're not forgotten and yeah. that you're progressing and you have a plan and we have some rough timelines and rough ideas and. Um, I've, I've, certain, I've received comments. Fair enough. We can do that. They're saying they're wondering. They don't know what's going on. Thanks. And I just have one suggestion because it, I'm very appreciative of you piloting something um, because I actually think that's a good thing for them to try it out. Um, but under promise and over deliver, make sure you've got the right dates because I think they've waited long enough now to try something that don't give them an early date and miss it. Give them a date and be early. It would be better. Thank you for that. And, and thank, thank you, Paul, for speaking up for me and my community. <laughs> <laughs> for my neighborhood, I mean. <laughs> my neighborhood, I should say, not my community. <laughs> so, um, okay, good. Uh, anything else on updates? All right. Um, so, I want to talk about the Transportation Benefit District oh, yeah, yeah. shortly here. And so we're talking about process, we're not talking about details of the project or whatever, right? So the process is kind of was, actually in the current agenda bill, it says we're, we, infrastructure, are supposed to return it to the council on December 4th. Okay? And we didn't put it on this night's agenda rolling it into December, but then realizing that because the 1st of December is a Friday, which makes the third of third Thursday in December after the, uh, the last city council meeting in December, which would be the third Monday, that if we did it on the 21st, we couldn't get back to council till January. Okay, so my thought originally, my bias is we've got a lot of stuff going on in December with, with budget and moratorium and all those things and I didn't have a problem with rolling it into the first meeting in January. Um, but I've heard some other people having that concern and it did say originally that it uh, could come back December 4th. So uh, the alternative we have, I'm gonna give you a couple of them, is we can do as my original thought was, roll to December 21st infrastructure committee meeting and then to the first meeting in January. Or if we think it's critical to have this addressed by the council in December before the end of the year, um, the last council meeting is the 18th. So we could squeeze it into our work session on Monday the 11th. 
and have the whole council look at that. And then if they feel good, they could refer it to the 18th or, uh, or kind of, because they can't officially, but uh, I guess uh, send it to the 18th for the whole council to, to address. Or if they don't have enough uh, consensus on the 11th, it could roll, it can roll back to us on the 21st and then to the first meeting in January. So the whole question to me boils down to, there's a whole bunch of details and times and dates. The question is, does it have to be dealt with in December? Uh, if it does, why? Uh, if not, can we let it roll to the, and the first meeting in January is the 2nd of January. <laughs> so it's pretty quick. I don't think much is going to happen between the 18th of December and the 2nd of January with holidays and everything as well. Um, so that's, that's the question is, is timing critical here? Something that I'm not aware of that this timing is critical? I'm not aware of any, so I'll ask any input from the two of you. Sure. May I go first? Yes. So the, so the idea, if, if you're asking this committee yes. that our recommendation is to refer it to the um, um, work session on the 11th. the 11th for possible return to the full council on the 18th, 18th then uh, I support that. And the, and the reason I'd like to have that conversation because we are... At least my brain is really immersed in everything money right now. We're doing the budget. And, and um, as, and I heard you two talking about this earlier, you know, we, we um, I had intended to say something about this last night in the budget meeting and I, and I ended up not and I just forgot. But we were, we were proposed, we were presented with, um, you want to look at one year or one project at a time, or do you want to look at everything that's unfunded for the next five years in the CIP? And I'm, in my brain, I was thinking, yeah, but a TBD could be something in between. Uh, and and th that's why I think it's an excellent time uh, to have this conversation during the budget time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Mary Lou echoes that with her scratchy yeah. voice. Yeah. All right. So, um, and I'm. And the process I, thing, though. Right. If we do do this, I think mm -hmm. um, Sheldon would have to. I don't even know if you can do that. It would have to. Would it have to be on. Go back to council on consent with a re referral. December 4 to. Yes. Yes, we'd have to update the agenda bill so that on December 4th, the council refers it to the session. Work, work session on the 11th. Right. Right, and I'm making no right. Right. Can, that. Okay. You, will it actually get on the agenda, or is it something we walk on on Monday? Yeah. On so the, the 4th? Done. On um, December 4th, I can make it on December 4th. And that's still before oh, the 11th. Yeah, we got plenty of time to get it on there. So there, there's plenty of time on that. The, the clerk's office can update the agenda okay. bill and put it on there. Yeah. So, so the point is, is on the agenda of the 4th, we, instead of referring it to infrastructure, it's going to be referred to the work session. Correct. And the work session will do with it as they fee, see fit, whether they get it back to city council on the 18th well, the, or in the January. The idea is, what I'm hearing is, is refer to the December 11 workshop with the expectation that it goes back to council on December 18. And then the council will do with it what they would do with it on at the workshop. Okay. I, I'll, I'll express, I, I, I'd rather do it the other way, but I'll, I'll go along with you all doing it this way. If you like, I don't see the, the jamming of things all at once, but it'll work for me. So you got it? Okay, and that and we should do that on the fourth. It, it it should come with an explanation. I don't want to know if we want to do it on consent or do we want to just do it on consent. I mean, I was just going to ask the clerk to put it on consent. Yeah, okay, it's up to consent because it's it's coming back there. Okay, so we can do it on consent because if I if if I was one of them and I saw that on consent coming to to the work session, I would probably go, huh? That's that's why I ask if there's a, an explanation that goes with it. So so do you want it? So do you want to keep the December meeting on the 21st, or do you want to move it a week in front? Regardless of the Forget TBD decision, th there's other items too, right? So yeah, we got, we got, we'll keep the infrastructure on the 21st next okay. month. Okay. We won't move that, and we'll deal with whatever we deal with on that month. We'll build that agenda. Okay. Okay? Yep. Okay. All right? Are we good? All right. We're adjourned.